So I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order because I believe we have enough folks um, here. Um, and uh, the focus of the meeting tonight is actually going to be on learning a little bit more about the strategic planning initiative, um, as well as some uh, updates on negotiations and um, and that's basically uh, it. We do need to choose someone who's going to be the evaluator for this uh, board meeting. So do I have one of the board members um, willing to take on that role? I can do that for you, Ann. It's Meg. OK, awesome. Okay, and uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but I think um, we have a lot of people here, and I'm guessing um, quite a few people wanting to speak. Um, I may, uh, I have a feeling that um, we're going to be hearing a lot of the same uh, information after a while, so I may at that point have Elaine just explain. Um, what's what's been happening um, so that we can get some information out to the community because there may be some misunderstanding about what exactly is going on so um, we'll see how things go um, where we because we have so many people um, we're going to need to keep comments to three minutes um, and i would like you to um, you know if if uh, after a while, if we're hearing the same thing over and over again, um, we have other things on the agenda, so we may need to cut off um, comments at that point. Um, and then hopefully we can, uh, generally we don't take any actions, but in this case, because it appears that there may be some uh, information that's missing for the community, we may go ahead and have uh, Lane speak to the community a little bit about what's going on. Um, so do we have uh, someone who would like to speak first or do we have well, Brian has raised his hand. So uh, Brian, you want to go ahead and have the floor? Thank you, Ann. Um, I'm sorry, folks. Um, I'm a little bleary eyed. Uh, my day started at 6 a.m. Uh, working on editing tonight's show. That's been the norm uh, for more than a week as we assemble pandemic theater. Thankfully, I have engaged adventurous learners who allowed us to pioneer audio only musical, an audio only musical. After teaching class this morning, I started to update my to do list uh, the status of the costume room, a $31,000 renovation, high density mobile shelving means moving 3,000 costumes, cleaning and painting the space, and getting a firm in Massachusetts that was ready to install everything in April 2020 off the hook. And I was getting ready to sacrifice a week of summer vacation to make that happen. So you won't find a high school in the state with that system, nor the vastness of our collections, because here at Randolph Union, theater is our football team. And I was shocked this morning to learn around 1030 that the full-time theater position, the full-time theater teaching position, is slated for being eliminated. Uh, that's odd for a school that's had a program for eight dec decades, an exceedingly accomplished program, um, one of this scale and scope. It's why Murray Auditorium exists. In 1967, folks took a huge chunk of this new wing to build a performance space, which we've re-rigged, rewired, installed new drapes. Investments have been made because this is the center. This is a center of our community but here we are talking about eliminating a job a full-time theater teaching position that's been at the center of my world for 25 years given the scale and complexity of what i do here i think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there and it's painfully clear that folks one don't know what i do and two don't appreciate it 
And I don't say that lightly, having chosen to make this my home for 25 years. See, theater isn't an extra. It doesn't just happen. It is created a long, complex, exhausting process. Six months of pre-production. Find the script, secure the rights, negotiate a contract, get those perfect things that make the show happen, whether it's an antique bakery case, a 1920s enamel stove, or a stand-in for the RMS Titanic. Casting scenarios, I cast a show twice. First, I find a show for my kids, and then I put my kids in a show, all before anything ever goes into rehearsal, and it's afternoons, evenings, weekends, an investment of thousands of hours, thousands of hours. But somehow, I should do all this in addition to a full-time teaching job. I, 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 I. This is the most demanding job I've ever had, and I love it. I find passion and purpose in research, adapting, rehearsing, and presenting. It is exhausting. It is why I bought that house on Mound Street, because you do not want to find yourself at 11 o'clock at night on South Randolph Road falling asleep as you're driving home. That is my level of commitment to this building, to this faculty, and this program. An average year for us is $15,000 to $25,000. New York all by itself is $11,000. I've taken 1,000 students to the theater district without a dime of budgeted money. I write the grants, I negotiate the contracts, I work with the vendors to keep the cost down so that every child with a deep involvement in theater gets on that coach no matter what they can pay for and they see a Broadway show and it changes lives. Look around the room. There are 40 on my screen and 115 in the wings. Look around the room and do not tell me that I should somehow teach full-time history and run this program on the side. Because it's grown during my tenure at Randolph Union, most people do not know that our theater is tax exempt in the state of New York. I did that so our kids don't have to pay the rooms and meals tax when we're there because it keeps the cost down. Negotiating with the head of the New York State Tax Department and with much assistance from central office. We've moved past the classic December main stage and a one act in March to three full seasons of programming back to back. It brought us three New England titles in nine years. That second main stage, it doesn't have the festival cast of seven. It might have 34. In the case of Mary Poppins, it had 65. Theater engages in meaningful, engaging work, wit, doubt, how to succeed in Mary Poppins. Now, I've long been accused of teaching history on that stage, and I'm proud of it because every show is a seminar. It is a deep dive into a specific time and place. We collaborate with young playwrights. We commission shows. We tell new stories. And our audiences, our loyal audiences, who I am surrounded by tonight, hunger for something original in a place where academics, community, and possibility converge. I love what I do. It is a privilege and a burden. And this proposal to eliminate a theater educator is not simply unfair. It is unjust and unreasonable. I'm sorry for my running nose. I have a, a sinus infection and haven't had time to seek care because I have a show opening tonight. It's ironically called Titanic. This program, ladies and gentlemen, is magnificent and you don't dial it back and pretend it'll exist as the same thing as an extracurricular. You don't tell an employee they're valued, give them plaques, applaud their work, literally stand and applaud their work, tell them they're a hub of the community, and then cut their teaching position and ask them to do two jobs instead of one. I don't know where I'd find the time and energy. And I can't believe people are asking me for more. After 25 years and two Teacher of the Year awards, a congressional fellowship, and three New England titles, people are asking me for more. Now, that's not a misunderstanding. That's what people are asking for. So 
This board has a decision to make because budgets are moral documents. Budgets tell us what people really believe. And I ask you, surrounded by 163 people, the vast majority of which whose lives have been changed by theater, how much does this board value the arts? So, Anne, would you like me to start calling on people with their hands raised in order of them up? Sure, that would be great. Okay, so Hannah Arias, I'm not sure if your hand is still up from the first one. If so, okay. Um, and thank you, Brian. Um, I'm going to go, I see Kate, but I don't see a last name. Is there a Kate? Hi, Ashley. Yes, I think you're probably calling on me. Does it have like a, an image of an owl? Yes. That would be me. Okay. All right. Should I just go ahead and then we'll go to the next person? Yep. Yep. Are you, are you going to speak? Okay. Yes. Yes. I just want to make sure you can hear me. So, hi. Good evening, everyone, and good evening to the board. Uh, my name is Kate Durth. I have she, they pronouns, and I am a graduate of the class of 2006. And I'm also a proud alumna of the Encore Theater Company, which I participated in working alongside Mr. Ranville for the entire four years I was in school. Recently, I've also participated alongside other alumni in the show, which happens to be premiering tonight, Titanic, um, alongside a lot of other alumni and good friends and family. Uh, and since being an RUH student, I have gone on to become a lifelong patron of the arts theater in particular. And today I serve as a licensed independent clinical social worker here in Vermont, where I specialize in helping folks recover from symptoms of trauma, particularly young people and families. So with the news that the board is considering cutting funding to this position, it's from all these backgrounds which I wanna to speak today. I wish to convey to the board what the theater department meant for me as a kid and what it means now. I was a Brookfield kid. I was a free lunch kid. And I came from a family that was deeply impacted by parent drug addiction and severe mental illness. Theater was not fun. Theater was not just a hobby and a fun place to go after school. Theater was a safe place. And theater was a place where Mr. McMeekin was a teacher there for a time, but where Brian was a consistent base where I could go and not only learn skills and build relationships that have changed my life. Um, I met my husband there and he's on the call tonight. Uh, it changed me as a person and it helped me become the person and the social worker that I am today. And I know personally, but also professionally as a social worker, what this community and what Mr. Randolph's leadership in particular brings to Randolph. And so for more reasons than I have time, I just want to say that the program saved my life. And it has made it so hard to hear that the board is considering cutting funding and cutting the legs underneath Mr. Rainville's leadership in that program because of what it meant to me and also what I know it means to the kids that are currently in that program and how it's gonna impact it for years to come. Encore Theater Company and Mr. Rainville's work is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And the school cannot say that it values his work or the role of that community and the work that those students have put into it and not fund it at the same time and communicating, whether implicitly or otherwise, that by withdrawing funding, it's expected that he give free physical and emotional labor to a system that the school benefits from, not just the students, but the administration, the community benefits from, is unconscionable. And I would be ashamed if my high school, for all the program has done for me and countless other kids, goes forward with this proposal. Mr. Rainville and everything that program have and will continue to do will change lives. Long after the pandemic ends, long after the enrollment issues that this traumatizing year has brought gets resolved to some fashion. But what this community won't recover from is the price that it will pay if his work and the work of this program are not supported moving forward. And so I urge you to continue funding and really show through your actions what we care about. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, next is Nora Skolnick. 
Hi, thank you. I will confess to being a little confused um, if I should be speaking now or if I should be speaking later, but since we're talking about the potential RIF, I'm going to go ahead now. Um, so I teach at Randolph Elementary School and I am co-president of the Teachers um, Education Association, Orange Southwest Education Association. Um, we are not here about negotiations this evening. The process for negotiations is very clear and the negotiations team for the union would be happy to meet with the board if members of the board feel that would be productive, even though we are currently at impasse. To say or imply that this potential RIF is the fault of the union is grossly inadequate, inaccurate, excuse me. The budget was set by you, the board. The decision of how much to put into each item in the budget was set by the board. The board went into the budgeting process knowing that this was a negotiations year, knowing that we were going to be asking for an amount that would see an increase in salary to make up for the money lost by increases to health care, health insurance costs. You knew the minimum amount needed so that we would not have to take a cut in the amount of income we take home. You, the board, chose to set the budget at the amount that you did. It is a choice. It is also a choice on how the total amount agreed to now by the voters is allocated. How much money will go into different departments and salaries? While the total is final, how much goes where is not final. There's flexibility here. In addition to this, there is federal money that has been allocated to schools for recovery. Over $4.6 million just for our district. Well, one might make the argument that a staff position doesn't fall into the category of student recovery from the pandemic, an idea that we, the union, strongly disagree with. Money that was originally going to enrichment programs or counseling could easily be utilized for this staff position, and those other things could then be paid for with federal money. However, I'd also want to point out that 80% of that money comes with no strings attached on how it is spent. However, we strongly feel that this staff position is needed for recovery from the pandemic. I believe you're going to continue, you already have, and you're going to continue to hear just how needed this position is. An investment in teachers is directly an investment in students. Cutting a position is cutting our ability to meet students' needs. It creates larger class sizes, cuts back enrichment programs, eliminates courses that keep students engaged in school, and decreases teachers' abilities to support students by increasing our workloads even more. This greatly affects our ability to help students recover academically and emotionally from this unprecedented year and a half. We are in a time when there is now a growing teacher shortage. Teachers are burnt out and are leaving the profession. This potential rift would add to that burden. How much more stress are you asking teachers to take on? Along with a growing climate of disrespect, increases in costs for healthcare, threats to our pension system, there is now the possibility of a teacher losing their job. You say teachers are appreciated. You have a chance to show that tonight with your actions. Cuts in staff, um, staff cuts are cuts in quality of education for our students. You, the members of the board, once again have a choice. Eliminate a position at the high school, hurt students and teachers, and reduce the quality of education in our district, or use the funds available to keep staff levels the same. The choice is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. So, Anne, just so you know, we are running over on three minutes. Do you want me to stop, interrupt and stop people? I think we're going to, because we have so many folks here and I would like to sort of hear as much as I can from as many as possible before we have to kind of put in Put a put a stop to it. Otherwise, we're not going to get to the rest of our agenda. Um, if we can if we can try to um, keep it to three minutes, folks, 
I'm sorry about that, but otherwise we won't. I want to hear from as many people as we can before we have to close things out in order okay. to continue on with our agenda. Thanks, Anne. So the next person I have is Jake Zanni. Uh, thank you. Um, in the spirit of uh, keeping things brief, um, most of what I have to say in support of Brian has already been said and likely will be said after I'm done here. So I'm just going to focus on one particular point that uh, has come to my uh, attention throughout today, and that is um, simply the fact that um, in um, several updates that he has given to the community, Lane has explicitly said that there will be no cuts, no academic cuts for programs this year. I mean, this is pretty obviously an academic cut. So, I mean, do you really want to make Lane a liar? I mean, that's all I have to say here. And that's all I wish to contribute at this point. Thank you, Jake. Um, the next I have is Danielle Gagnon. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes. Thanks, hi, Anne. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Danny Gagnon. Uh, I am a, two, a 2012 alumni. Wow. And I participated in um, our UHS drama program all four years at college. I am pretty sad that this is why we are having a drama kid reunion. Um, but I am not surprised because really I think that's what the ETC theater program taught us. We show up, we do our best, and we do what we think is right. So today I'd like to tell you why I think the theater program is an investment in our students' futures because it invested in me. I think theater is one of the best hands-on learning experiences and future workforce skilling programs that RUHS has. Uh, when I look at my experience with the drama program and how it's impacted my life, I look back at high school when I was very shy. And even freshman year, when I was trying to look around, figure out where I was going to fit in, I was lucky that I found theater quickly. And even for somebody as shy as me, there was a role, and that was technical theater. Essentially, being a techie changed my life. Uh, back then, I would be surprised that I'd be speaking now. <laughs> Uh, but I went from hearing that girls were supposed to be small, clean, and quiet to being in a group where girls were in charge. Neither I nor anyone else would ever assume that I couldn't lift something that a dude techie could lift. Um, and so I learned that it was safe to try new things. And so I did. And I learned new skills and my confidence grew. And I not only learned I not only learned how to collaborate, empathize, and be a good human, but I learned incredibly technical skills that look really damn good on a resume and helped me get a theater scholarship that made my top college possible. So when I look at how Mr. Rainville has made this program an ultimate mentorship program, a top class drama program in the state, and an experiential learning space, I look at how he's using this. He's looking at this through the lens of a teacher. He's looking at it uh, where he's seeing all tasks uh, available and turning them into learning opportunities and using it as an opportunity to expose students to options and types of work that they couldn't have imagined as possible. Um, at least I couldn't have imagined were possible back then. And so we all learned skills and we learned about ourselves in a safe environment. And we learned these skills in this safe environment so well that we are then able to leave this context and the safe walls of the theater to go apply this, what we've learned about ourselves in new contexts and more challenging contexts. And so I look at myself and my fellow drama kids and I realize that we are more resilient because of this program. And I wonder how many girls might have been inspired to study engineering because of the theater? How many boys were inspired to go to college after falling in love with acting? And how many students won their battle against depression because they found a community? So I'm looking around at the screen today and I'm seeing that I, I, and I know that I feel invested in and I assume and know that my peers also feel that. 
So today uh, to the board, I ask that the commitment to the drama program, Mr. Rainville and this community is continued and, and supported going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, David Terranetti. Hi guys. <clears throat> I will uh, try to keep the waterworks turned off um, as I go through what I've prepared to speak of today. <clears throat> um, I had a fairly limited time um, uh, working directly um, with uh, the ETC theater program. Uh, graduated in 2014 from a different high school, but I did uh, I did participate for a year. Um, but that time in of itself and the time that I have spent in theater programs since then have uh, have drastically changed me and changed my life. <clears throat> I will not pretend to understand the unique difficulties, hardships, and effort that it takes to manage school, students, parents, and of course your own additional hardships, both in more normal times as well as those <clears throat> additional obstacles that have affected us all during the pandemic. Success is abstract and difficult to measure by any ruler, standard, or metric. Its definition changes depending on circumstance, perspective, and life experiences. That being said, I want to acknowledge the difficult choices that the board makes regularly and can only hope that those choices influence current and future students for the better. All that in mind, and with all due respect, I cannot help but feel that just as I lack an understanding of the difficulties facing you all today, that many of you lack an understanding of the impact your decision <clears throat> and the proposal regarding the theater program at RUHS will have, not only on the future of the student body, but your future, as well as the future of the community and nation at large. <sighs> Theater and the arts in general provides so much more than a fun time <clears throat> playing pretend or just something to do during or after school. It's a means of expression, decompression, and of healing as well as learning. <clears throat> Learning to value the small things through the eyes. <laughs> through the eyes of Snoopy and the children from the Peanuts gag. In your good man, Charlie Brown, happiness is finding a pencil, pizza with sausage. Mm, and telling the time. Learning compassion mm, from Oscar Madison and the Odd Couple. Learning the importance of truth both externally with others and internally with yourself, if you'll pardon the pun. <clears throat> Learning the importance of being earnest from Algernon and John in The Importance of Being Earnest. Learning the gravitas of historical events through works such as the Diana Tapes, or A Man for All Seasons, and even Titanic the Musical. In my case, also, a, a fair amount of learned humility as an actor turned techie as I worked behind the scenes and gained an understanding of what challenges are faced in that role, and not to mention how annoying some of us actors can be. <sighs> Above all, these irreplaceable experiences have afforded me and others the skills and practice necessary to not only step into the shoes and mindset of characters, both real and fictitious, but also into the shoes and mindset of my fellows to thus gain insight in their, into their own difficulties and to be more patient, compassionate, and forgiving. As I wrap up my thoughts for you here today, I am reminded <clears throat> of the words to a song from Rent. Uh, 5,000, oh, pardon me, 525,600 minutes. Five, uh, 525,000 moments so dear. 525,600 minutes. 
how do you measure a year? In daylights, in sunsets, in midnights, in cups of coffee, in inches, in miles, in laughter, in strife, in 500 to 25,600 minutes. How do you measure a year in the life? How about love? All of that is to say, however, <clears throat> pardon me, however you choose to measure your lives, the impact of this drama program is and has been immutably immeasurable. And you do yourselves and the students for whom you work so hard to provide a bright future for a disservice by removing this opportunity from them. Thank you. Thank you, David. Richard Hutchinson. Uh, hi, uh, David, thank you for that. Um, I think that covered almost everything I was gonna say. That was amazing. Um, I, I wanna echo what everybody else said that I mean, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for Mr. Rainville in the theater department. And if, if there's no greater measure for me of the importance of Mr. Rainville in particular in this role, this last year told me everything I needed to know, it, it would have been so easy for someone who works so hard, like as Mr. Rainville does, to say, well, you know what, we can't get on stage. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll box it up this year, we'll take another crack at it next year. And he didn't, he did not. He went out above and beyond and created a show <laughs> that exists only in audio format. He thought outside of the box and made that happen, bringing together alumni and current students and made it a musical. And if that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about the importance of him in this role, then I don't, I don't, I don't know if I, if any of us can get that across to you, but removing his position and expecting more than he's already given. His heart and his soul is abhorrent, and I am ashamed that it's even being discussed right now. I hope that you reconsider this strenuously. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Ainsley Cook. Hello, all. Um, I'm currently sitting in my St. Michael's College dorm room as a freshman, um, and I just all of the points that have been made, I just wanna reiterate, this man has done so much for this community and to cut him off at the knees is wrong. In every shape and form, it is wrong. The theater program is probably the best thing that Randolph Union High School has, and I do not say that lightly. I have taken into consideration the sports and the writing programs and the Racial Justice Alliance, I have taken that all into consideration and I still say that it is the best program, probably in central Vermont, maybe even in the state. It influences us so much in so many different ways that you cannot possibly understand unless you walk into that building and you see what we do on a regular basis. I was looking at the OSSD mission statement and even the mission statement, whatever you wanna call it. And even though I'm not gonna, say it out loud because I'm sure all of you are very familiar with it. It covers every single bit that you want covered. It covers technology. Here, I'll just pull it up real quick. It, it covers technology. It covers learning about diverse communities and identities. It covers so many different things. By taking away classes and under and cutting him off and, and cutting it in half, you are taking away that opportunity from kids. This program and this man, this friend, this teacher means so many different things to so many different people. I came here in 2016, a girl fresh off the bus from Atlanta, and I had no idea who I was and what I wanted to be. I knew that I wanted to join theater. And as soon as I got that man's email, he immediately put me into a leadership role. And I am doing what I love today. I am studying theater because of this man and what he let me do when I was just a 14 year old. I want to do this professionally. Isn't that what Randolph Union is all about? 
is set is setting you up for your future and getting you to the career goals. I mean, that's why we have the tech center. That's why we have things like senior project, right? It's because we're setting ourselves up not to fail and to continue doing what we love. He has pushed through lawyers, doctors, teachers, career professionals. I'm sorry, but do you see any MLB players coming from the football team, or not the football team, the baseball team? This man has single-handedly created a like a professional, I don't want to say cesspool, but a pool of professionals. And you're going to cut it? Are you serious? That's ridiculous. And if you cut this man's full-time job, you are cutting away at the program. And it is going to suffer and this community will suffer. The greater Vermont community will suffer even. Schools look toward you, our UHS for its theater program. People come to us to look at our collections and borrow from it because it is so large. Please, please reconsider making this a part-time position or whatever you are doing. He has done so much for this community and if you are thinking of undermining that and cutting it away, I'm sorry, but that's just wrong. So, like I said, please reconsider this. It helps people. It is a safe haven. It helps people academically. Reconsider this, please, for the love of God. I would not be who I am today without Mr. Rainville and without ETC. I don't know where I would be today without them. So please reconsider your stance. Thank you. Thank you, Ainsley. Um, next we have Kimberly Medina. Hey, can you guys hear me okay? Um, so I am currently, I'm about to finish my second year at one of the top law schools in the country. And as I was thinking about my time, thinking about everything that I've been through in life to get to this point, every skill that has gotten me where I am today, I can trace back to my time at Randolph Theater. From public speaking to soft skills, like understanding the perspectives of people who are different from me, to being able to put myself in other people's shoes, to just thinking on my feet, faking it until I make it when things go wrong, uh, the persevering and diligence, all of those things that have brought me to where I am, they all I learned from Randolph Theater. I can't imagine where my life would be without my time in high school at the theater program. I can't imagine what high school would have been like without this program. Murray Auditorium was my second home. ETC, the ETC group was my second family. Mr. Rainville was more of a father to me than my own father was. You can't do that with just a part-time position. You can't create that kind of community that kind of family with just a part-time position or a volunteer position, it's not possible. So I just want to echo everything that everyone else has said so far and that this program is truly life-changing. And if you care about your students, you will care about this program. And if you care about this program, you'll care about keeping this position. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, Josie Turinetti. Um, I think it's kind of already been stated or kind of implied, but the theater program, it's not just a program, it's a family. It creates a sense of belonging to those that feel like they're without a place. I don't just speak for myself, but I had the great privilege of being student director for multiple years during high school. And I got to work closely with 
the technicians and the actors and even some of the people that have spoken already today, I was able to see them grow and progress in this program. There is not enough emphasis in today's society on family. There's so many people that come, students that come from broken homes that don't feel like they have a place where they belong. And theater provides that, not only that safety, that community, but this is a family. These are, these are friends that, you know, will support you and encourage you throughout your lifetime. And it really gives us the confidence that we have the people supporting us that we need to be able to accomplish our goals in life. Um, I currently am studying communications, business communications, and my time in theater has really prepared me for that and given me the confidence to pursue my dream. I also had the, the great opportunity of, of um, performing in the role of Eunice Kennedy. Um, it allowed me to connect to the past and to history and this incredible woman and to be able to see and find myself in her and in this character that I was playing. And I intend to continue um, using the things that I've learned in my life. And so I would really ask you to reconsider because I believe that this, this family, this community is something that will greatly benefit not only the Randolph community, the state as a whole, but also the nation and the world. Um, thank you. Thank you, Josie. Um, next, I have unknown. I'm not sure who that is. It might be me, MK, and I'm, I want to hold this up. I'm taking the unknown space. I just want to hold this up for everybody to see. Um, I had the incredible privilege of working closely with the theater company, ETC, with Brian through five or six years. This is a chimney sweep from Mary Poppins. This represents our community. This represents education and our community. My daughter was in seventh grade. She's now a freshman at the University of Vermont. And she wants to do theater because of this. I know many of you were part of the Mary Poppins production. It was not only an incredible show, but it was an incredible learning experience. And the fact that Randolph actually, for a moment in time, funded Brian and the ETC program fully was a beautiful thing. The loss to our community, if this is not fully funded, will be huge. Whether it's the moment in the theater going to Chandler, or going to New York City. This is what we've done in this community. The same community that figured out how to order straws and fray them at the end to make chimney sweeps. Think about it. Because if this board doesn't vote to fully fund this program educationally and from a performance-based perspective, we will have great loss and I don't think we can recover it. This is a very, very, very important moment. And as a taxpayer in this community, I urge you to consider the importance of this decision. Here, look one more time. I have many of these that I saved and little did I know that I would be saving them for this moment. And thank you to all of the students who came to my house, including Brian, to make these. Thank you, Mary Kay. Um, but there is still an unknown um, that was the above Mary Kay. So I'm not sure. If Okay, then we're gonna to go to Ryan Anderson. Good evening, can you hear me okay? Yes. Very good. Well, my name is Ryan Anderson and I am from the class of 2005 and I too am an ETC alum. I'm attending this from the West Coast 
where I've taken the afternoon out of work for I would be remiss in not speaking out against any cuts, changes, or reductions in scope to Brian's role. As a former high school teacher myself, I'm keenly aware of what enables student success, and I cannot help but emphasize, like Kate and Josie earlier, the importance of elements like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if you're not familiar with the principle, I'll post it in the chat after this. But in my own adolescent years, Brian and the theater program fulfilled every single tier of that hierarchy. Consider the basic physiological and safety needs met by providing a safe space to stay after school while my parents ended their work shifts or the psychological needs of belongingness, love, and esteem by fostering a community where intimate friendships, prestige, and a feeling of profound accomplishment are nurtured. Consider that final tier of what teachers everywhere strive to provide their students a sense of self-actualization where one realizes their full potential, including but absolutely not limited to their creativity. And I think that sense of self-actualization is so evident here tonight in this room. In a rural area such as Randolph, uh, it, which is just plagued by unmet needs, Brian's role and the program at large fulfill elements that are clearly imperative to student success and frankly are not fulfilled anywhere else in the school, at least in my experience. So by cutting, changing, or otherwise reducing the scope of Brian's role and the theater program, you will be denying students the opportunity for self-actualization and creating a dire deficiency that will be felt in ripples that I'm afraid you may not have considered. And so I'm, I'm reminded of Demetrius from A Midsummer's Night Dream, who pondered, are you sure that we are awake? It seems to me that yet we sleep, we dream. And forgive me if I offend, but I too am left wondering if you who make these decisions are awake, and if so, are convinced of the outrageous mistake you are on the cusp of making. And I implore you, do not do this. Thank you, Ryan. Um, next, we have Zoe Gabby Smith. Is Zoe still here? Okay, um, I believe this is probably Keith Minsinger. Yes, it is. Uh, can you folks hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, th thank you all uh, for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, you'll forgive me, I didn't get a chance to prepare remarks for this evening. Um, so much of what I would hope to say has already been said by uh, so many people much more eloquently than I could ever hope to do. Um, but I, I do want to underscore two points. Um, you know, I graduated in the class of 2003. Um, you know, got to spend a great deal of time with, uh, you know, in the theater program. And uh, I want to say that uh, Mr. Rainville has been a huge influence on my life, uh, you know, through theater and as, as a teacher. Um, and, you know, theater really did provide me now in my job as a, a museum professional working at, at Winter Term Museum Gardens and Library down here in Delaware. Uh, where I live, um, 
as a way to consider culture. Uh, you know, theater is such a wonderful tool uh, to examine other people's perspective, other people hit on it. And I can definitely say that without the roles that I played in the theater uh, with Mr. Rainville, I would never be able to consider culture uh, in the ways that I do now. Uh, that have helped me grow into this career and really deeply think about, uh, you know, how humans express themselves, not only through words, uh, but through objects, through theater, through the things that they claim to love, the things that they claim to hate. Um, it's been immeasurably helpful. Um, and I also want to speak as well for uh, Brian's role outside of the theater program uh, for my two brothers who are also RUHS uh, alums. Um, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, I think all three of us would say that Ryan helped shape us into the men we are today um, by pointing us to opportunities and to things even outside of school uh, that you know we may not have ever encountered. I, in one of my summers, went on a uh, UVM funded anthropological field school that Brian had uh, pointed me to, up to far northern Quebec uh, to spend time with Aboriginal Canadians. Um, and that was an immensely powerful experience for me that I would have never encountered or dreamed of doing if it wasn't for Brian Rainville. And to ask him to do the, everything that he does uh, as an extra, I think, is frankly absurd. Um, and I fully understand that Randolph Union High School is, is facing budgetary issues, but have, as other people pointed out, there are have, funds have been made available. And I had looking through the most recent budget numbers, I can see that, you know, money has been released from the state money has been, you know, will be released from the federal government to help uh, make up those deficiencies in budget. Um, and I urge you to explore every possible means that you can examine to try and make and try and allow this to not happen. As you can see here from so many people, uh, like 186 right now, I can see on the screen are here to tell you how much this program means to them and how much Brian Rainville has shaped them as a person. And I think that should speak volumes. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Laura, stories? Thank you. Um, I'm a mother of three graduates of this program. They actually are all online tonight, which uh, shows you how important it is to the family. I don't usually get all three of my children at the same time. Um, so it, it's a pretty big deal for our family. I was a school board member in Randolph at the high school at the OSSU board for over 20 years. I know the work that you do, how hard it is, and all of the things that you do to think about for the children of our communities. I've had the chance to visit school districts all across the state. I've worked in a role that has taken me there. And I'll tell you that I think we have, without a doubt, the best theater program in the entire state. I think it is what makes our UHS shine. I, it's what I'm most proud of because of all the things that everybody said. Um, Brian is, my daughter said earlier tonight to me, he's a gem. He's given more than you will ever, ever have paid him to do. Um, I think you should invest more in this program and I just want to say two things that came to mind as I was listening to people tonight. One is that there's a little phrase about how some people come and go in your life, but others leave footprints on your heart and stay with you forever. That's Brian, and that's this theater program. And we're lucky to have him here. I think he could be anywhere in this country, frankly. And we have him here in Little Randolph in central Vermont. Um, the other one is something that a mother told me when I was a teacher many, many years ago. It's that anyone can count the, the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in a seed. Brian has a way of seeing every student that comes before him and seeing what they're capable of, that they can grow into a tree and bear fruit. I've seen him take students that are challenging and find meaningful ways for them to contribute to this program. You can't do that in every classroom, in every aspect of education. This is such a wonderful, unique program that I think that whatever you invest in this program, you will reap many times over. 
and that's clear tonight. So I thank you for taking the time to hear from me. Thank you, Laura. Casey Bonnie. Casey? Okay. Aiden Wright. Uh, I, uh, I will go. All you did. Sorry about that. My name is Casey Bonnier. I'm class of 2009 ETC alum. A lot of other people have said things much more eloquently than I have. I will keep it brief because I know that we've got a long line behind me. And I think that's the first point. There are 187 people in this meeting right now. I have got a massive line behind me and they're all here for Mr. Rainbill. All of these people drop what they're doing. I'm supposed to be getting ready for work right now and I'm not. Other people are skipping work for this. All of this because we support this man because he supported us. As Kim had said, and as others will probably say afterwards, he, for me, he was a second father. For others, he was a first. This man gave everything to this program. He's given everything to this school. I have a lot of experience, unfortunately, with town and city administrators who pat you on the back and say how appreciated you are and how wonderful you are. And then as soon as anything goes wrong, you're out on your ass. It's really unfortunate. And I really did not think that I would see it here. And I'm disappointed. And I know, I know, I know, I know that things are so hard right now with COVID. I have to deal with it at work all the time. Budget cuts, we do what we have to do. But as been pointed out as well, we have money available. We make sacrifices, but we also value what's important. And your vote here is your voice. And you get to set your values and say what is important to you. As everything has gone sideways over the past year, we're all stuck inside. We're all can't go out like nobody can go to the bars. Nobody can go do whatever, go bowling or anything. What did we turn to? We turned to the arts. People watched movies. People listened to music. People created. All of this stuff was how we com compensate, how we dealt with all of this. And that directly comes down to this. This is the arts. This is the basis here. This is where it starts. And if we just cut it out now, and I know, I know we're not cutting the program. I know the program will still exist. I know that Mr. Rainville will still be the director he wants to be afterwards. But as has been said, you're cutting him off at the knees. How many other teachers are being asked to do two full-time jobs or three full-time jobs for the pay of one? I don't think that there are any who are probably making that requirement made of them. I'll leave you for one more thing because I've got a timer going. I was a two-sport athlete with varsity soccer, varsity lacrosse, and I was ETC. I ended up leaving soccer because ETC was more important to me. What was my proudest moment when I was coming out of Randolph? Was it stopping a penalty kick in soccer, which was difficult, hurt? Was it scoring my first goal in the varsity game of lacrosse? No, none of that. It was when I got to climb onto the stage as a senior, I got to close my eyes and find my light. That was the best moment of my high school. I am, went to St. Mike's because of Mr. Rainville. I met my wife there. I got established in my career there. All of that came from him. And that is why I managed to talk my devout Catholic wife into having Mr. Rainville officiate our wedding instead of a priest. She met him once and had no questions. This is one of the best people I know. And I will confidently say he is the best teacher that you've had in a generation. And you've had some good teachers. Don't please just give him the support that he has given you over these years. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Casey. Um, I just think out of fairness, Anne, I want to look to you again um, because it's 7.30. Yeah, we're, we're at an hour of Casey, listening. And it, right. and it does sound like we may continue to hear and, it, and it's coming across loud and clear that this community, that the students in this community, that the parents in this community, that the alumni in this community value the importance of the art. And um, so we have heard you loud and clear, and we will take that um, message further. We are working on sort of a strategic plan that, that is looking at 
and and um, building goals for the community based on the values that the community is putting forth. And what we're hearing very clearly here is that the arts and the theater program are a super important part of that process. So thank you very much for sharing with us. I apologize that we can't have you all speak, um, but we do need to continue on um, with the meeting. And would it be possible to hear from some of the this other staff? Because there are wider ramifications to these cuts as well. I mean, we I understand the time position, but I, I do feel like it would be important for the board to hear from some of the staff members who are here as well. I don't have to be that guy. There's others who can speak better than I. Um, if, if I could take just a moment, um, I just think it's important to note with the community here that Mr. Rainville was not the only person to receive a RIF notice today, um, that one of our mathematics teachers um, also received one. And just to say, uh, and, and I'd love to turn it over to him to, to speak to that as well, but, but I'd just like to say that, that we, we run a pretty lean ship. Um, we've just begun to be able to offer classes like coding and robotics in the mathematics department. We would like to be able to offer more than than just the very very basics. And uh, in the science department where I work, we've you know cut down to where we can't offer many of the offerings that many people have valued. And uh, and further cuts are are, are pretty damaging. Um, but I'd love to turn it over to the math department to to speak to the implications of their RIF notice as well. That seems to be on another topic. Um, well, I guess it, it may be related because uh, I can tell you as a board member and and having made the, the put together this agenda, I had no idea that any of this was happening. I heard about it today through email and through Facebook. And I believe probably most of my fellow board members have just heard it now as well, um, or were hearing from, from community members um, throughout the day today. I have a full-time job, so I was also working, but I was checking my email a little bit um, and did realize that something was going on. So um, at this point, the board doesn't really know what, what <laughs> Well, so so Anne, can maybe if we could have a point of of clarification or, or something. So, and and I think that's what I was trying to bring up earlier is that um, the union has a has a right to be able to speak to the board about rifts, and and I believe you have to make a decision tonight because contracts have to be issued by April fifteenth, and rift notices have been given before we had that opportunity to talk with you tonight so i i and understand that they can be they can be withdrawn a contract can be offered we're not at the okay end. i'm going to stop you here because people are talking in conjecture and not correctly no one received a riff letter from me or a notice from me today people were given a heads up from their principals and their administrators that it's possible that they may get one so again I think it's awesome that folks are talking, but there is a lot of misinformation about a lot of parts and pieces flying around right now, which is why the board um, had scheduled time for the RIF discussion later in the evening to be able to actually have a discussion and not as part of the public comments. Folks have a right to public comments, but there was a discussion that was specifically set up um, for the union, and I think that's what Ann was alluding to. But again, we're getting very far afield from, from some actualities here, and I, I think I need to put that caution in there. So, right, yeah, and that's, so I guess that's the, what I'm trying to clarify. Right, so Nora, on, the, on our agenda, we do have uh, a negotiations update, and we have the opportunity for the union to discuss potential rifts. So that is coming up on the agenda. So that's why at this point, if we can, because we've I've, I've given an hour for community feedback on this, I we're getting we've got a long we've got a really strong message. We hear the message from the community, um, 
And if, if I could take I just I 30 forward. seconds, Ann, can I, can I take 30 seconds on this? I, are, are you wanting to speak to the RIF notifications? Because it can you hold off until we're on that? That well, topic I, of the I would except that except that the minute you say we're going on to um, discussions uh, that are purely business, we're going to lose about half the people. And and I really would like to talk about the level of commitment and respect that we have in our math department now. And, and we did receive a heads up that there could be a rift within the math department. And the trouble here is, it's not me. And yet I've been here less than two years. We've had turnover in this school. We need to show commitment to our people. This is not the way to show respect and commitment. That's my comment abbreviated. So, so I think that, I, I think, Anne, that that there has been some, some Nora, I would let Ann facilitate the meeting. This is not your meeting to run. This is Ann's. Please let her speak. So I think we're going to talk about we're going to give you the opportunity to to respond to the RIF notifications or or what it sounds like folks are feeling like they're they've been given RIF notifications in being told um, that there might be a RIF. Um, and again, as a board member, I want to know that information as well. So I am looking forward to that agenda item so that I can hear um, from Lane and from the board members who were on the negotiations committee so that the rest of the board, because that's not the whole board, can get updated with what's, what's going on. So um, I think we're going to move forward to the, to the to the rest of the agenda. Um, people can always continue to send us um, emails um, to the board in, in support of what you, know, what you want. We did hear, we did listen and hear a strong um, support for the arts, for the theater arts, for perhaps creating a position that includes the performance program so that the person that is doing that is not having to teach a full course load and then continue a second job in the evening to run the theater program that came through um, very clearly um, and the benefits to that. So um, I think we'll move forward and um, see, see what comes up and you'll have an opportunity as um, uh, the union rep to respond to um, the information that Lane presents regarding where we are with negotiations. So at this point, I'd like to move on. Um, we do have a, a board training discussion. This should take about five minutes, and then we'll be moving on to the negotiations section of the uh, board board meeting. Um, so board members. Um, so, I'm so very rude. Uh, board members, we need to um, make a decision about our July meeting um, as to whether or not we want to use that meeting for some training um, on uh, using our policies and be working as board members. Um, so, uh, the question is, um, are, are folks, uh, willing to use that time or, and, and ready to set it, set aside the, the July meeting to do some training, um, as a board. So I need someone to, to move, or do we want to have some discussion about, uh, whether or not we want to use that July meeting for that purpose? Currently, we don't necessarily use that meeting time. So, board members, are we are we uh, do we want to use that July meeting for some board training? Need to have some discussion on that. 
I'll I'll speak. That's fine with me. I'll I'll just say it's it's tough to transition um, from what is a, an intense and emotional uh, conversation. So I think that might be why you're not getting a lot of response. And um, I think it's worth acknowledging that it's really hard to move on to businessy type things. Uh, and I'm glad to see so many people have have stayed through this businessy thing. Um, but if if we could great let's use that time to train and let's keep going um to the to get to the rift discussion because we're gonna i i might even propose moving that up in the agenda um because it 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 doesn't make sense to me really uh, on frankly an emotional level to stick business in the middle of these two very um uh, if you want to make that uh, motion, we can go ahead and we'll move that agenda item. Do you want to move to do that? I move that we uh, up the agenda item having to do with unions speaking to RIFs uh, to the present moment. Um, do you want to move that or do you want to first hear um, the negotiate the the update from Lane and then the rebuttal from the union or do you want to just move the union because what first i believe they need to respond to what lane is presenting lane is that not correct in in how this offer how this works um they were i can talk a little bit about the the rifts and the the purpose and the cause i can tie it into um potentially what's happening with brian which i think is important for people to understand um, the union has uh, has a right to be able to talk about um, the RIF pieces as well, which is why we schedule that time um, for them, kind of similarly to what we did um, probably, I think it was probably back in January um, when we talked okay. about the RIF at, at the Career Tech Center. So does your so does your update need to come before theirs, or can we just move the the union up to the top? Uh, if if you guys. Uh, you guys are right. If you guys want to move to change, change it and talk about it first, that's perfectly appropriate. Okay. So do I have a motion from Hannah to move that uh, the union's discussion of the potential rifts up? I'll there. second that, uh, Katja. Okay. Thanks, Katja. So can we have a um, any any discussion on that before we do that? Okay, um, so can I have uh, a vote on the the uh, motion to move the opportunity for the union to discuss potential rifts up to the front of the um, business portion of our agenda? All those in favor, uh, I guess. Do the raise voice. your hand <clears throat> and it might be your best to do a voice vote roll call okay voice voice vote so uh ashley uh yes and katya yes and hannah yes and megan yes and brian yes and uh Rachel's not here. Rachel's not here. Chelsea. And our new board member, Chelsea, are you with us? Yes. Yes. And I, I'm okay with it. So that's yes. And I believe that's all of us. Okay. So um, the floor is yours, Nora. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask some of my colleagues to speak as well. Um, and, and also to please understand that part of my statement earlier was part of what I was gonna present now on, on the impacts of this RIF. So I, just to I'll summarize, since I read the full statement earlier, um, this is a decision that does need to be made tonight. Contracts need to be issued to teachers by April 15th. So there is gonna need to be a vote tonight on whether or not to riff these positions. Um, I also want to say again that this is a choice. This is not from negotiations. This is not from um, lack of money. This is a, a choice 
that the board has to make tonight and a choice that I think you have heard can have an extremely um, a huge, huge impact. I'm, I'm at a loss for words at how big an impact this can have on our school, on our community, on the students who we currently have at the high school. Um, you have heard the impact this particular arts program has had um, and the, the positive impact it has had on so many students. The fact that we had over 180 people at this meeting tonight, and, and I didn't even count how many wanted to speak to this issue, shows the impact. And I know that you have heard that loud and clear. There is money available. How the board chooses to allocate money within the budget is, is a choice. It can come from other places, but I would also say it doesn't need to come from other parts of the budget. There is money available, over four and a half million dollars, that will more than cover um, the positions that are being contemplated getting rift um, as a reduction in force. That can happen no matter what settlement we have um, in terms of negotiations. The fact that we have not settled in negotiations on a salary should not, is not a part of this, should not be a part of this. Um, this happens regularly. Regularly, there is no settlement. Regularly, um, par both parties that we have to go to mediation or even um, fact finding in order to reach a settlement on an agreement. The board has to plan for that just like teachers and staff have to plan for that. Um, an investment in teachers is an investment in our students. This is a time that you need to put that investment into your staff. I would like to turn the floor over to, um, as I said, my colleagues to speak as well. Thank you. I don't know, Vicki or Tim or... I also can speak. Thank you. Vicki, if you want to go first, I can go after. Um, sure, I just I just wanted to, to, to sort of pick up where we left off and just say that, that uh, to lose a math position at this time would be incredibly difficult. Um, we are, um, yeah, and, and obviously to lose to lose uh, uh, the drama position um, would also be really, really difficult. Um, we we're we're very very lean. We have um, to, to, this is an opportunity to to create the schools that we want for our kids, and it's not just to maintain the schools that we want for our kids. We don't want our kids only able to take you know just basic reading, basic writing, basic math. We want them to, to, to have a diversity of offerings, to be able to see, to, to learn mathematics through robotics or through coding. These are not extraneous extra positions. This is just trying to maintain the program that we have. Um, in the past seven years since I've been here, every department has lost a position. Um, and you know, we, we've, we've corrected for any declining enrollment. This is this is just trying to maintain the, maintain what we have, and and improve upon it as best we can. Without these positions, we're we're going to really be struggling. Anyway, I'll I'll hand it off to Julia. Hi, I'm Julia Schuster. I'm a ninth grade history teacher um, at RUHS, and um, so I would like if the RIF happened, um, my position, I, I personally would no longer be at Randolph from what I understand. Um, I'm part of the ninth grade team. And as we all know, we are in the middle of a, we are, we've been in the middle of a pandemic for over a year. And um, a key part of just making sure that the kids are safe and well is stability. And our team has worked so hard together and with, the counselors at school and the administration and all of the other grade levels to just make sure that we're giving the students the best support that they that they really, really need right now. And we heard how that support can come from the theater program, that support can come from diverse offerings in 
um, or just maintaining offerings in the math department. But I guess I would just say like, I, I've built relationships with students over the two years I've been at Randolph. And I think that is something that a lot of them need um, just um, on a daily, on a daily basis. Um, and so um, I, I agree with everything everyone's already said about the um, theater program and mathematics. And I don't think from what um, I understand it doesn't sound like they, it, these cuts need to be happening. Um, and I just would say like, I care so deeply about the students as I know we all do. And I think what is, I just don't understand why we would make a decision that would hurt the students, which I think removing any level of stability and dedicated, caring, educate, like just, yeah, diligent staff from their lives. I don't understand why we would make any choice that would make that happen. Um, so that's, that's my two cents. <laughs> Teb, did you want to speak as well for the union? Yes, I'm trying to, yes, I would love to. Can you hear me? It's my, my mute button is still. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think you've already heard many times over um, a lot of what I have to say. So I, so I think part of what I want to do is just to, you know, I'm a history guy, so I just want to place a little bit of this in context. Um, you know, you're, you're contemplating a position um, or maybe it's more than one, you know, Lane, I, I apologize if, if we've said things or if members of the community have said things that aren't entirely accurate. I think um, this has all been happening pretty fast. And I think it's confusing as a representative of the association to get, as we did, communication um, from the district that a RIF has been contemplated at the point we are in negotiations um, and then to hear sort of trickling through my building administrators and colleagues what different people have been told. So I apologize we're, we're piecing it together. But I just want to give a little bit of a sense of how it feels to work at a school where this kind of information is trickling in. Okay, I've been in this district since I was the age of Julia, who is my mentor. I'm her district mentor. <laughs> and Brian Rainville, was my mentor as a new member. And um, and yeah, it's Jake's on, it's great to see you. You were in the first class I soon taught it. That was that was a long time ago. Um, and man, if this year and especially this last few days had happened when when I was a young teacher, it would certainly have driven me away from the district and likely the profession. And I don't think I'm the only person who is feeling this way on our, our faculty and staff right now. Personally, I'm still processing the ways these rifts or these potential speculative conditional rifts would affect my work and my department and my relationship with my mentor who clearly is, um, I'm sorry, my mentee who is having a lot of uncertainty about her role and her value in this district. My department, which um, presumably would be losing, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it would get sliced, but I'll tell you one thing. Any way it gets sliced, it will lead to um, some kids getting less of something. Um, I think the, the implication here is that we are overstaffed, that the people who are working um, are too many, that, there, that there's work that could be done by fewer hands. And Frankly, that, that is confusing given the premise of these level funded budget negotiations. It's um, also just, it, it feels like you, if you think that you don't understand what we do. Um, personally, I'm really worried if these, if these risks were to come out of our department, the impact I would have obviously on theater as has been um, so eloquently stated tonight, but also on some other things that I think are near and dear to my heart and, and our community. Senior project? project-based learning, the PBL program, AP classes. When you ask us to do more with less, you get less. So um, I also just wanna remind us that over the past year, the teachers and counselors and paraeducators and front office staff and custodians and food service workers and bus drivers 
and so many others in this district have made extraordinary sacrifice for the children of Randolph and Braintree and Brookfield. And we are not asking for thanks. We did this because we are professionals and because we love what we do and we love this community and these kids. What we are asking is to recognize our humanity and that as human beings, there are limits to how much you can ask of us without investing in us. We're wearing out. If you live in Vermont, you know there's only so many miles you can put on a set of tires, only, only so many times you can peel out in the parking lot, or you gotta get in Craigslist and get a new one. We've burnt through a lot of rubber this year, folks. The constant switches in learning modality, public meetings unlike this one, which has been so, so heartwarming and nourishing to hear the support in the community. Because a lot of meetings this year did not feel like that. It felt more like our professional and even moral integrity was being questioned and our concerns about safety were being minimized. And we did not hear leaders in the district stepping up to defend the work that we did the way that our former students have tonight. We have been through endless cycles of contract negotiations. We faced significant hurdles getting this board to the table to, to recognize that we're in a pandemic and deserve an MOU in recognition of the change working conditions. And I know that the pension stuff isn't on you, but that's real too. So now this, after this year, and I'm not saying it was in any way an intentional attempt to influence contract negotiations, but it certainly feels like a choice is being offered where either we settle for less than we feel like we deserve or somebody gets cut. So that's your decision, okay? We, we are not accepting any responsibility as the union, as the staff for making those decisions. Our understanding is that there's a fair amount of flexibility with the budget that you have. And we understood that there was a, a, a surplus that the decision was made to largely give back, which is an understandable decision. We know that there is a principal at our high school who will not be um, returning. That's your prerogative to decide how to use that. And of course, there's the $4.7 million from the Fed. So again, the idea that this is a forced choice is, is, is not true. Um, but what I want to just finish on is there's a real cost to operating this way, even if you choose ultimately not to make these risks. And I'm not just talking about the financial cost, although I know that PHO does not work for free and we have been in a lot of negotiations. Um, we would be, you know, that's, that's a separate issue. But I'm talking about the human cost, the impact on the human beings who teach, care for, treat, feed, support, transport your children and the district's children. And really ask yourself whether this is a good way to approach managing the human beings who, who, who do this work, okay? Um, and also, I just like to say, like our working conditions are your kids' learning conditions, straight up, okay? And when we talk about our safety during the pandemic, we're talking about our safety, we're talking about your kids' safety too, especially now that so many of us are vaccinated. When we talk about racial equity, or other forms of equity, or push back around mandates around standardized testing during the pandemic, it's because we want your kids to have a safe and humane and meaningful learning environment. When we say that we're feeling burned out, disrespected, unsupported, shut out of important decisions, when we oppose reductions in force, when we oppose having too many initiatives, when we say our, we're overloaded or our caseloads are too big, it's not because we're essential workers who don't wanna work. It's because we wanna work under conditions that we know are the best conditions for your kids to learn under. Okay, I'm just gonna say it one more time. Our working conditions are your kids' learning conditions. And you need to take that into consideration in making all these decisions. Thank you. And can I just jump in for a second? This is Chris Armstrong. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, I, I almost I wish that that Lane had gotten a chance to go ahead because, as he said, I think um, sometimes I don't think everybody here understands the situations and how everything came to to be. And this has been kind of a scattered meaning a little bit. Um, 
I guess it really it, it comes down to the fact I feel that we're we're heading in a direction where we are we're we're going to hear that because the teachers are trying to negotiate for a higher salary, the budget that was created won't be able to cover all the positions if we do that. So as Teb said, it's kind of this this give or take. Um, you can either have a, a better salary or you can have less of you or we're gonna cut positions. Um, and I think it's important for the community to know that, that Lane does have to make this decision. It's in the contracts. Um, he needs to give RIF notices by a certain date and, and based on the budget that was created, um, he needs to make those decisions on whether or not there's going to be enough money for those positions. I guess my big concern is that, um, as Tev said, there's there's pension negotiation. There's there's been a teachers have suffered. Um, they their con our contracts that we provide our teachers in this district have been watered down um, in the last few years, uh, mostly because of like government um, decisions that were not local decisions. However, the teachers, it's a fact that at this point. Many teachers are working this year for less than they made the year than they made last year. It's just it's just the, the fact of, of how negotiations have settled and decisions that have been made around the state. And so that that I just hope gives some context as to why teachers are asking for for improved working conditions or for improved um, salary. It's really not it's it's to make up for the losses that they've already got to kind of settle us and get us whole. And I just really worry that that we're getting in this us against the community or us against the administration and that's really not the situation the the decision that's being made it has to be made right um but i wonder why it wasn't brought up earlier why wasn't it brought up in the original budget when we when we talked about this this is something that we've been dealing with for years now um and if we're if we put ourselves in a situation where we have to make this tough call and and we have to decide to cut a position or keep our district competitive and attract and keep the best teachers to keep the Brian Rainvilles in our district. Um, I feel like that's something that should have been addressed earlier. And that's it. The board is now in a, a hard position where they have to make a decision on where that money is going to come from. But I, I really feel that um, as a taxpayer, somebody who grew up here, um, I can't even tell you when the last time Randolph voted down a budget. Fair enough, the, the community's been incredibly supportive of its teachers um, and anything that's been asked, okay? And there's been some big asks over the last few years. Um, so I, I wonder why why this hasn't been brought to the community. Um, and, and I think we have to understand that it's an issue that needs to be addressed earlier on in the year. It's an, it, it, The board has to decide that they want to make our town make our district competitive and to bring in good teachers and keep good teachers um, as Nora said earlier there's a lot of teachers that and as Tev just said there's a lot of teachers that are burnt out that are leaving the profession I'm sure many of you I, I see a lot of faces that I grew up with a lot of faces of kids that that we've taught um, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of good a lot of good teachers have left the profession and, and we're in a, a tough situation where now we're making we're decided if we have to make cuts or not um, when I, I really think that the whole thing could have been avoided if we really, as a community, decide what do we value? And it seems like you guys do value the, your teachers. It, it, you, you, you value Brian, you value us. And, um, and I hope that that's just something that the board will take in consideration as, as we move forward, because this isn't the end of budgets, this isn't the end of um, decisions that have to be made. And we need the support to move, to move forward and to actually make the community and our district what we want it to be. And as a taxpayer in this community, I'm very curious and upset that we learned about this. I learned about this today from a student who graduated in 2016 in a panic text that he picked up on social media that Brian Rainville's position was at stake. And I am abhorred by this as a taxpayer and a community member. And I've put three kids through this school and not, not, none of them are currently involved in the school. Why are we learning about this today? And that's a big question because we are the people who are paying for this along with the federal funding. 
And we are invested in this community because we love this community. And we've decided to be in this community. So that, Chris, to your point, I am super disturbed about this. As a person that has put three kids from kindergarten through and has taken advantage of the beautiful things this community has to offer and are now at stake. Eight hours? That's not okay. It's not okay. Let's not forget it's opening night too. So you waited for a night that there's a theater production. Nice planning. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I come on sort of an outside. I want to start by saying this is Lindsay Hopped. Um, I'm an alumni. I love our community. Um, I love theater. Um, I've heard all sorts of different information, and I don't know how much of this we're allowed to have, but my understanding as a taxpayer is that the percentages that are being asked are very steep percentages for, for salary hikes. And I, I support our teachers, but I think we've all seen a really hard year. And I know a lot of other professions that are not being given, you know, raises that are above the sort of mean of what those out there are. And so I'm just, are we allowed to know those amounts as taxpayers to be able to kind of voice? Because I'm all for raises, but I think they need to be reasonable given the scenario that we're all in. And I think it's important to recognize, I, like I said, I love teachers, but I also love the healthcare providers that have gone out and away and those nurses that are burned out. And you know, a lot of places don't have a union to fight for them. It's great that you guys do, but I think we need to make sure that we're just making sure that what's being asked is truly fair and, and it's nice to be able to see numbers. I think that really helps. So saying, okay, this is how much we need because our healthcare increased this much and this is how much we do to be able to make it could be really helpful for folks. Um, like I said, I love our programs. I love our schools. I want to support our teachers, but I think that we also need to really be mindful of, of every profession that's struggled in these last years. And as taxpayers, we have to come up with those extra funds. If there's COVID funds, great, but we also have to look beyond COVID. So. I'm just wondering if there's insight that can be spread there for some of us that have heard lots of different things outside of the community and are kind of curious what that looks like. Yeah, Lindsay, I'll just get to that really uh, quick. Um, first of all, wait, wait. First of all, this is not really the time for, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Anna, I, I believe this is not public comment. If you want to take right. public comment, we can take public comment. I will just end on on the fact that, I, that all negotiation sessions um, are open meetings and open to the public and they're advertised. I know I've, I've seen some faces that are here at those meetings. So Lindsay, if you, if you want to be a part of that, those are open meetings um, where everything is discussed, proposals are discussed, rationales discussed um, with that intention that I think we don't want people behind closed doors trying to share information that may or may not be true. So I just encourage you or anybody else who's interested in the future to come to those meetings and hear for yourself firsthand um, any of the issues that you have concerns about. Yeah. All right. I was going to echo this is this is not the negotiation session and everybody is welcome to come to those yes thank, thank you for for pointing that out chris um so are there any more union folks who want to speak or teachers who want to speak to these rips okay lane and uh perhaps some of the board members on the negotiation committee want to Want to, um, well, I think what's going on. I think okay on the rift side. I think that's what we need to speak about first. I appreciate after almost two hours of finally being able to talk, um, because I think again there's been a lot of misinformation that's been floating around. I think well-intentioned misinformation, um, but 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 not quite accurate. Um, I'll start off by saying the basics, um, and. This idea that the OSSD is a district and the union um, as a body are symbiotic. In other words, the desires and the demands that one places on the other certainly does have an impact on outcomes and on the decisions that the other party needs to make and other party needs to react to. Um, it is disingenuous to pretend that, as uh, was stated by a union member, we are accepting no responsibility, that all this is on the responsibility and a symbiotic relationship on the district itself. 
there are two or three areas where rifts are coming from. And so I'll talk about the one that's most pertinent right now. And that's the one um, that I think we need to spend a little bit of time on. And that's the one that's potentially um, affecting um, Brian's position. Also want to go back and say a few other things. Healthcare negotiations were last year. The union had an opportunity in good faith uh, to argue and to negotiate last year when healthcare was on the table, uh, raise in salary, and they did manage to do that. They got higher than an average raise in the state last year. Um, so again, there's a lot of parts and pieces that, 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 that just aren't connecting, but let's go, go to the risks themselves. And I, I told the union going all the way back to October um, that this might be an issue because the budget was locked in before negotiations were concluded, which is where we're at, right? The budget was locked in as of January 1st. The district had to estimate a salary increase for the teachers. And we did. And we did our due diligence and we did our job, right? It was not a failure on the district's part. We took a look at what the historic state averages were and we put in an amount of money to cover those historic state averages right, with no ifs, ands, buts, or problems. The current ask from the union, and Lindsay, this will go to your, your question here, um, when we started off negotiation, is they were asking for 13% over two years. We are going into mediation with the union asking for 11% over two years, which is significantly higher than the state averages and significantly higher than the settlements that are coming out now, which are ranging between 2.25% and 3.2%, with one odd district out there that settled for 3.5. Okay? So we're in a whole different world than what the district could reasonably predict um, for, for, for salaries. Um, and I have to say this as well. If we predicted too high, if I asked for too much in a difficult year, right, because I have to predict it, the budget fails and I have to make cuts. And if I predict too low, right, if I predict too low, then we've got a similar problem. I didn't put enough aside, I'm going to have to make cuts to make up the difference. So this balancing piece was done very carefully. It was looking at what our past negotiations settled at as well as what's happened historically um, around the state for the last five years. The current ask from the union is significantly higher than what we budgeted and we're going to mediation on this. Means that we couldn't negotiate anymore. They weren't willing to come down anymore and we weren't willing to go up given um, the state of things. They're currently 150,000 more than we budgeted for. If they go back to their original ask, which is possible when we go in with the mediator, they're asking for more than a quarter million more than we budgeted for. They're also, I do appreciate the fact that they took off the table, they were asking for a retirement benefit, which would have added 400,000 to the budget. And I did the numbers out in detail twice and had them checked. So we're talking significant amounts of funding that folks are asking for. I don't have it in those amounts. The federal money is not meant to be paid um, in teachers' salaries and bonuses. It is meant to help for the recovery from COVID. The ESSER two funds that we are working on right now are designed for us to be able to get what we need to give the students back what they lost during this year of COVID, which will mean if we can do it and we get things resolved and get our recovery plan done, probably hiring more staff once things are approved. The ESSER three funds are designed to be used to making whatever facilities requirements need to happen, whatever programmatic requirements need to happen to make sure that all students are back in school, full in person at the start of next year. Again, they are not designed for, for, for teacher salary increases through contract and budget negotiations. A matter of fact, there's even a line in there that that's not what they're for. So again, 
I know that people are trying to do their best. There's a lot of information. It's tough sometimes to keep it all straight, but this is not the case. So where, where are we? So looking realistically at where things may end up, um, because we don't know, in the budget negotiations, I'm stuck in a position with a fixed budget, with a significant potential financial burden liability that I have no way to accommodate for short of cutting staff. And that's the position, unfortunately, that I have been placed into. So when we did the calculations, um, based upon their 13% their, their over two years, it was 2.66 staff to cover that excess. To cover the 11% that they are currently asking for, it's 1.6 staff members. 0.6 right now are planned through through attrition. We have some teachers that are leaving that aren't coming back. So we have 0.6 that we're not planning on rehiring. The 1.0 gets us down to Brian's position. And I wanna talk about that position for a little bit because for decades, um, right up until about two or three years ago, Brian was a social studies teacher and he ran the extracurricular program and he was paid separately for both. He was also given a significant reduction, and this is not to demean Brian, I think Brian is the cat's meow, I respect him completely, but we've got to talk about, about the realities here. He was also um, given um, one less prep than other teachers, he wasn't given any kind of duties um, to have to do, he wasn't required to, to, to do advisory. So about three years ago, um, Brian was a social studies teacher, came in with this idea and said, hey, um, let's try to expand the theater program a little bit. Let's put some classes in that run during the day um, and see what we can do. And so we tried it. The classes were incredibly lowly enrolled. They ended up being bolstered by the fact that when um, the staff realized how few students were signing up for it, the RUHS administration mandated that middle schoolers take these courses to get the numbers up. Without those middle schoolers in the, the, the last year, the numbers for Brian's classes, he had 10 sections, um, they were all semester classes, um, all 10 of those sections in total would have served 16 kids. Okay? There is incredible value to what Brian does. There has always been incredible value, and I will be never, ever argue that that, that, that is not the case. In fact, the um, discussion that Brian had about, you know, the funding to get his storage up and his costume programming and all the money that went into that. If Brian remembers, he came to me and I'm the one that fought the fight to get him the tens of thousands of dollars to make that happen to support his program. All right. So the reason that this position was chosen by the RUHS administration was because of the low enrollment. And we are not losing Brian. We are not losing the drama program. The extracurricular drama program is not being cut. It's the same as it has been for many years. The only difference is, is that Brian will return to the teaching role he had three years ago and for many, many years prior, teaching social studies classes and continuing to run the extracurricular drama program as it has existed for decades. So it's really going back to the way that things were three years ago. Okay, so again, I know that's not going to appease folks or make them happy, but I think it's important that we fill in the other details along with the story of, of what was presented here tonight. That position um, is actually not Brian losing it. Um, Brian has seniority, so Brian actually bumped another teacher who is here tonight um, to move into that social studies position. Now, all of this said, what is most likely going to happen is what happens every year when we get into mediation. We're going to get into mediation. The union is going to come down to, the, to what's the, the state average. We're going to have an agreement. This is going to be fine and we'll be able to replace the positions. That is typically what happens. But I can't guarantee it. And I can't put the district in a financial hole of $150,000 to $250,000. Can't be done. And so that's the reason for this rift. 
on the math um, question, that is a whole other piece. And that is required through the contract language and through changes that the union asked for two or three years ago. These, uh, the math one is being affected uh, because of grant funded positions. We have positions every year that are funded by federal grants. The problem is, is that we have to put contracts in teachers' hands before we're assured the money from the grant agencies. So in this case, we have about $540,000 in staff that are funded through grants, which is a huge liability on money that I'm not sure is coming in until the agency tells us. So every year, these folks get riffed. 99.9% .9 of the time, June comes around, around June 15th to June 30th, the grant funding agencies give us the, the, the go ahead and then we're able to hire those folks back um, and put them to work. Um, can't, it's not guaranteed, it's not 100%, but it's about as close to 100% as possible. Prior to a couple of years ago, what was done was uh, these individuals received uh, contracts from the, the previous administration that was here. Nora, stop shaking your head because you and I sat and had many meetings about this. They would give them uh, contracts um, that were outside of the union, outside of the CBA, with little lettering in the bottom that said this is a grant funded position, it's not guaranteed. The union legitimately and rightfully said that those folks should be a part of the CBA. I agreed. Being a part of the CBA, however, means that those grant funded positions, because of the way the contract works, they get rift every year and then they get hired back when the grant funding is assured. So again, there is a significant amount of other information that's pertinent to the story that we are engaging in here tonight. Again, I will push back dramatically on the union on this idea that this is all administration and that they take no responsibility to use their own words that were spoken here tonight and that they're not a symbiotic unit with us because they are. Our decisions affect them intimately. Their decisions affect us intimately. The best thing that we can do is work together. If there are concerns about how these things are falling out this year, then let's work together to make them better. Work with us to find some language so I don't have to riff the grant funded people every year. That would be awesome. Work with us so that we get negotiations done prior to budget time so that we don't have to guess at what we think or where we think budgets are gonna end up. That's my piece. I'm happy to answer questions, thoughts, comments. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna ask board members first, Brian. I see your hand, Brian. Um, but I'm wondering if there are other board members who have questions for Lane regarding this, or maybe any other insights from the board members who are in the negotiations with Lane. Do we, do we have any questions, Hannah? Yeah. I, yes, oh, please. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I will say that um, I, by training and degree, am a theater person. So it, it's, I'm, you know, there's some personal stuff coming out here. But I just want some clarification. Um, so the, the theater position, an extracurricular position, is, is being riffed because it is grant funded or because of enrollment, uh, just bear with me. So we need, to, we, need to, we need to make up the potential difference for the ask of the union in terms of salary negotiations, right? They're asking for a lot more right now than we put aside. And things are pretty serious because we're going to mediation to decide it. So I have to come up with potentially somewhere between 150,000 and $250,000 to cover the possible outcome of those negotiations because they are unknown. The way I can do that um, is given the fact that staff is 90% of a, a district's budget, 
um, is to cut staff. And I have a limited time window in which to do that. As, as I believe it was Nora alluded to, contracts have to be in teachers' hands on April 15th. So these decisions have to be made prior to April 15th before we put those contracts in hands. Brian's position was chosen by the RUHS administration because he made a change three years ago. He was a social studies teacher um, who ran the, the drama program. Three years ago, we tried something. We said, okay, let's try to have a full uh, let's try to have your position be full drama courses. So that's, and he switched out of teaching social study into teaching drama courses, you know, suitcase theater, technical theater, main stage theater production. We couldn't get enough kids enrolled in the program, right? 16 students had uh, in the, the high school had signed up for it. And so the administration scrambled around to try to figure out a way to make this work. And the way that they did it was they forced the middle schoolers to take these courses and to fill up those numbers, right? And they made it mandatory. Um, and so when we are looking at potentially cutting a position this year, this was the one that they focused on because of the low enrollments. Brian is not losing his position. The drama program is not going away. It's going to exist in the same for it, form it has for 30 years. Brian will be a social studies teacher. He will have more students to work with, which is awesome because Brian's an incredible individual and it's going to give him more exposure with kids, um, which I think is fantastic. Um, but he also receives the benefit that he doesn't, he loses a, uh, a section of teaching that he doesn't do. And he also doesn't have duties like other teachers do to help him out with this drama piece. So again, it's, you know, it, it, it's not, my intent is not to make people necessarily feel better. My intent is to try to get people to understand the rationale behind the decision making, I think, that went on. So sure, Hannah, then, yeah. Does yeah, I appreciate sense? that. It it does make sense. I'm I'm trying to uh, clear up in my head and and try to make a distinction between academic and and part of the curriculum and extracurricular. So theater again, not to get too personal, but theater can belong in a strictly academic setting rather than extracurricular. There are extracurricular programs right now that have low enrollment and their coach. Now, I, I don't want to, it's kind of the stereotypical thing that the arts are pitted against athletics, right? And why is one funded and the other isn't? Well, I don't think that because one isn't funded, the other one shouldn't be funded. I think that's just creating the division that much wider. But it, I think it is telling that there are athletic programs that have very low enrollment and yet are getting still getting that money funneled to them and the coaches are still being paid. And I'm married to one, so I, I have skin in this game, okay? But I, 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 it does seem to me that theater and the arts is being undervalued here in favor of it, it, it could it could be perceived that it's it's in favor of extracurricular activities when theater is academic it is curricular um i know that physical education is as well but the the teams are not uh, i may have not made any sense but and well drum drum the drama program here has been extracurricular for ages we attempted, we tried to do something different by adding a bunch of, of courses. They didn't Blaine, fly. I need to disagree. What's that? I need to disagree. My predecessor, Charlie McMeekin, had one fifth of his day devoted to theater. When I was hired, three adults, three adults worked in the theater program. I was not alone. When I went to administration. They did not come to me with a novel idea. I went to them and said, this is unrealistic. I'm being asked to do two jobs. It's burning me out. It's unfair and it's harmful. That's why this happened. 
That's why this position was created. I went to administrators and said, I need your help solving this problem. Under enrolled, I taught tech theater for 24 children in a semester. If we because they were mandated to be there. No. Brian, I went through the numbers with folks today to be sure I was accurate. They may have been mandated to be there. Live. Anyway, we, uh, Anne, I need you to gain control of the meeting. Um, I don't remember public being invited in. Hey, can you uh, convert the superintendent's salary to the theater program? Because that sounds like the ideal solution. Uh, come on. Uh, can, um, Anne, can I, can I wrap up? Yeah. I, I would appreciate it after 25 years. Um, those initial discussions talked about junior high electives. And part of why they talked about junior high electives is we burned three teachers out already cycling those children through without support. So they landed in my lap. And they're fun and they're sweet kids and I love them. And it's building out the base of what we do. If you go back to my numbers before COVID, before a split schedule that limited what our students could take, you're gonna see healthy enrollment. And the idea that I'm not doing a full day's work I was hired originally to teach five. When Charlie retired, I taught four. Then we went to teaching six, and the TA was taken away, so I'm still teaching five, which is still a very full day's work. I don't have a JV program. I don't have a junior high program. I teach three seasons back to back all year. No coach in the building has a roster the size of mine. We celebrate theater, we value theater, but clearly you want me to do this after school out of the goodness of my heart, instead of saying, isn't it cool what Randolph has built? Thank you for bringing it to this place and we support it. I am really struggling as someone who taught classes this year because administration came to me two weeks before we opened and said, hey, we need somebody to do AP. And I taught AP. And I picked up another class because a colleague was overwhelmed. And I picked up another class and I still did the shows. So please don't ask me to roll backward, do more and tell me I'm mistaken in that view. I'm being asked for two jobs for one money after 25 years. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how you explain that to a room with 140 people. Okay, um, May we, I? Are, we are way over our time limit and I'm wondering, uh, again, I know there's public who want, who want to comment. We allow our public comment in the beginning and I need to hear from board members and I need to move our, our meeting along. Lane, I would like, um, so when you when you say the the union has said that we need to have uh, approval of these rifts, um, is that something the board is voting on tonight? Ah uh, yes. Okay, so board members, I want to know from I've heard from Hannah. I'm wondering if there are any other board members who have to make a decision tonight. If there is some other clarifying information that you would like to hear, may I may I add to the to the conversation? Um, I guess I would prefer to hear first from Lane since we've heard a lot from the union and you and you had your well. I guess we're still in the um, we're still in the responding to the rift. So go ahead, go ahead. I think that would be all right. Okay, thank you. So I don't think um, the, the union is not arguing. We, we, we had a grievance on the grant funded positions. We lost that in arbitration. We understand that that is, is you feel or um, that that's something that you need to do. We, um, while we disagree with that, 
there's nothing we can do about that. That is that is your decision. So I, I want to make that clear that, that that is not what we are discussing tonight. I also want to make it clear that we are not discussing negotiations tonight. This is not a negotiation session. We're not discussing salaries. We're not discussing how much, um, you know, the board has to make some decisions. The decision whether how to how to spend the money that was voted on in the budget how to spend the money that is coming at, in that that 4.6 or 4.7 million dollars that's coming um for covid relief to decide if this arts position it falls under that category and i and i think I, other people spoke far more eloquently than I can that, that yes, this is part of the recovery for students. This is helping students deal with the trauma of the pandemic along with the daily traumas that um, students that age have to deal with. This gets them through it. This is support for them. Um, I'm, I'm not going to keep going on that one. As I said, others spoke far more eloquently than I can about that. Um, but the um, the money is is there if the board so des desires to, to use it for that. Um, but every other district in Vermont I know of um, is doesn't make rift decisions or to cut decisions on the outcome of negotiations. Negotiations are a, a fact of life that um, happen um, on a regular basis. The union does want to have a, a, a two-year agreement, so maybe we can have a break from negotiations, as I'm sure the board would like as well. It is the the decision to riff or to set the budget is the board's decision. It is not the union's decision. And of course, the union is going to be working for salaries to um I'm sorry, I'm going to take that one back because, as I said, this is not the negotiations session um, that, that is happening in mediation. Thanks. Okay, so I just have a, 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 a piece here that I think is important. It is true that a lot of other districts don't have to riff because of negotiations, but that is because the unions in those districts are coming in around the state average in their negotiations. They are not holding out for 13% over two years or 11% over two years. And I've done the studies, I've seen where people have settled this year so far, and they are all in the range that I, I explained earlier. We are going to mediation because the union right now is holding out for 11% over two years. I, I, I no, just, can I just jump in one second? Again, I just want to reiterate, this is not a time for negotiations and there's so many. I'm not negotiating. I am making a counterpoint, Chris, to what Nora, to what Nora you said. Interrupt, could you please let me just finish what I wanted to say? Thank you. This is not the time to discuss the negotiations. That's why the negotiation sessions are open. There's been a lot of oversimplifications on both sides about everything. I highly encourage anybody who's interested in this so that we don't end up in these situations in the future to come to the negotiation sessions when we do have them because they're open meetings. And to, 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 to throw out a percentage and to say it in, in a certain way right now, whether I say it and, and try to skew how the public sees it or whether you say it and, and try and use your version of how you see the proposals, this isn't the time. So please, everybody, if, if you're interested in this, come to the negotiation session so that you can hear both sides have the time that they need to talk about it. This is not the time to talk about it. This is not the time to have the discussion to go into the detail. Right. What I think again, what it what is on the what's on the table tonight is whether this position is getting ripped. That is what it's what needs to be decided tonight. Whether whether the the the, the school district is going to have the staff needed to meet the needs of their students, whether they're going to invest in the education of our community. How can public oh. members get access to the negotiation sessions, Chris? Because this has, I haven't known about this and I really want to attend the negotiations um, sessions as a taxpayer. Can I just put yeah. in here that the chair of the board has been trying to get a word in here and, and I, I need, I, I want to encourage Anne to speak as loudly and rudely as I can sometimes. 
Um, and I, I'm not trying to silence anyone or interrupt anyone, but we need to rein it into a little bit more of a structured deal. Yes, and I apologize. This is only my second meeting, and I am I am doing my best. And I was totally blindsided by this thing arriving um, today, and I had a full day of work that I had to do, so I wasn't able to focus and figure out what the heck was going on. So I apologize for my <laughs> meeting. Um, style and and I do want to hear from folks what I, what I would like to do as as the chair is board members we need to we're going to have to make a decision so I've only heard from Hannah I'm wondering if others have questions are we ready to um, approve the, the rifts is that Lane is that what our I I'm trying to recall from our agenda meeting, this is just negotiations update. I didn't realize we are. So there, uh, there's two pieces. Yeah, there's two pieces on there. There's is that in. That's a separate piece. So where is that in the agenda even? So uh, uh, number three, board management and governance um, negotiations update, which we haven't done yet, and then opportunity okay. for the union to discuss potential risks before well, before the vote what we just we just moved that to the front so we just did the, the union just told us their perspective and now um i thought you had your rebuttal was your negotiations update but maybe that's not it so do you want to i i think we need to move on because if there is a an action that the board needs to take we need to hear sort of the other side and the update in terms of what's going on so uh, eventually there will need to be a vote on the riff um, piece um, i don't doesn't bother me when you do that it might make most sense now that we've had the discussion on it before we move on to the negotiation piece would be my my recommendation uh to, so can you please clarify for board members what exactly these whiffs are going to be and can I get some clarification because it sounds like depending on how negotiations end up none of these rifts may even take place is that am I understanding things correctly so there there's there's two pieces here um there are 5.16 FTEs um full-time equivalent people that are funded by grants, um, that are professional staff, and one support staff member who is funded uh, by grants um, that would receive a RIF and would be called back immediately once that grant funding is assured. Uh, the district liability in this, if the RIFs are not granted, um, is $545,000. Um, in terms of the second piece, um, we've done what we can um, to not have to riff any more than we need to, um, because like I said, we dealt with some of that 1.6 um, FTEs and cuts we were looking at by um, attrition, a person that was leaving and not replacing the position until we're sure the money is assured. Um, the 1.0 riff is specific to making sure that we potentially have what we need to cover what may come out of negotiations. And that would be restored um, you know, at the end of negotiations um, if, if the money is there, if, if we're down in a, in a range that's close to the state average. <clears throat> Can I add that okay. negotiations will not be over until... Oh. So, sorry. Um, whatever, yeah. yeah. I, I think Lane is in agreement. Negoti I think you need to know that negotiations may not be over in well until next year but potential liability um, for not making this riff um, is 100 to 150 thousand dollars okay for that's the second riff that's the second one yeah that's related to negotiations 100 to 150 thousand yeah that's so, what we're cutting between the riff and the the the, the attrition loss okay that and and the other riffs are just those grant those grant riffs that we have to do okay so do board members understand that he talked to us last board meeting about the the first batch of riffs 
that are those grant funded positions that once the, the grants come in and it's just a matter of timing that that makes those those rifts have to take place so that he's not over budget for what if, if for some reason those federal grants don't come in. The second RIF, if I understand this correctly, Lane, is um, because we don't know how the negotiations are gonna end up. And if they it comes in higher than what you've budgeted for, then um, we'll need to, uh, we won't have enough money to afford to have that, that one teacher that needs to be riffed at this point. And that teacher would be the, the ninth grade social studies teacher, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Board members, any questions about, and, and it's now that the board has to decide on supporting those RIF notices, is that correct? Okay. So board members, I see your hand, Brian, but I, I want to give the board members a chance to make sure they understand what they're voting on and what this is all about. Um, and uh, it's 846, so I want to kind of keep us and get us back on track. Chelsea, I see you. Go ahead and, and ask your question. So I just have a question about if the RIF is not approved, what happens? Then That's you need to tell me who or what I'm cutting. And there will be a cut. Again, the budget is set. It was set in January. There is no more. We plan the budgets out um, uh, six months to a year in advance, which is a really kind of crazy system, you know, um, to, to how to do things. Um, but it, it's a set, set sum of money. There is no more until the next budget season. And so it will have to come from somewhere else. It will have to be another program or another teacher. And it can't be another teacher at this point in time because as soon as April 15th passes, um, whichever teachers get contracts, I can't you know, rescind those after the fact. So this April 15th deadline is critical. So if the RIF is denied or not approved, then it just goes back to negotiations and you have to like find another position to cut or find some money there's no cut. negotiations i have to i have to figure out something else in the budget to eliminate which means losing other programming or something else for the kids um, that was planned on or is important for us towards meeting our ends um, that the board has charged me to do um, I don't know what it would be um, because again, the, the problems with school budgets are the majority of the money in the school budget goes to salaries, right? Um, you know, probably 90%. So I'd have to go and, and scrape and hopefully I can come up with it. Hopefully the, you know, the best, best scenario is, you know, we come to an agreement that the union's happy with, that the district is happy with in the end and that, you know, is, is doable within the budget that we have. You know, that's, that's the best scenario. Okay, any but. other board members have uh, questions? I know public wants to comment, but I'm, I'm afraid you're not going to be able to comment. I just have Ryan. one question for Lane. Yeah. Um, so if we do come in at a, you know, the, the budget or the, the after negotiations are complete, will, the, will Brian have his job just the way it is yesterday? Everything will get restored, and as long as the middle school students are still mandated to go over there, and he's got his enrollments up, there's not a problem. And the, and the ninth grade social studies teacher will stay the way it is, if if the negotiations come in. Yes. Okay. But as as Nora was was pointing out, um, we don't know how long negotiations could take. I just want to take a second and just say, um, in the meantime of all of this happening, I will be without a job for next year. So all those ninth graders that I built relationships with and the current eighth graders who I know and who could have a stable, consistent adult as their ninth grade history teacher, this all creates so much upheaval. If I don't think I'm getting a contract, why would I not look for another position and, and go to another school? So I just want to say, like, if you, if you the board, say yes, we're going to approve this change, maybe, yes, okay, if, like, I just don't think we should be tying this with negotiations the way 
as Nora has said, because the negotiations happen every year. This is a, um, yeah, like this is creating a lot of instability to say that Lane, his job is to design a budget that is going to serve our community. And it's not, why is it on my back that he designed a budget that doesn't support our students yeah. as best as it may be? So I apologize. That, for that is a complete and utter mischaracterization. This budget was designed incredibly thoughtfully in an incredible detail with incredible study to what the unions are, are negotiating for and getting. The issue right now is that our union is asking for 11% and holding firm and we're going to mediation. And this budget cannot sustain an 11% ask right now. There is not that kind of money in the budget. So Julia, I understand and I feel incredibly bad, but I am in a position where I have to make sure by law that the district stays in the black. And just just so you all know, that is one of the 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 uh, limitations that we do place on our superintendent is that he can't spend money that he doesn't have, and and he is we are sort of putting him in that position um, if we don't have that money. And again, it does it makes this whole negotiation. Uh, process kind of uh, extremely difficult and hopefully we can work on a better way to, to do it so that the timing doesn't come out like this because it makes it very difficult. Ashley, Megan, Katya, I'm curious, do you have some questions? Do you, are you, are, are we ready to put this to a vote? Is everybody understanding what we're voting on? I, so, I, yeah, go ahead, Ashley, sorry. Okay, um, I have, I do have questions. Um, and to be honest, I, I don't feel prepared to vote on this. I think this is, um, as you pointed out, Anne, it, it seems like I was not well prepared um, for this discussion this evening. Um, but I'm curious, I do know, and I do appreciate Lane sharing in the past about the grant funded positions. And I just have, I have a few clarifying questions. Um, we'll know by june 15th if we have secured those grants is that the timeline lane typically the grants um can i've seen them as early i've seen them as early as the end of may i've seen them as late as july it all depends on the grant funding agencies we have a very good team um, that pulls all this together um, and gets the amendments into the grant system on time um, so it's just a matter then of waiting for the uh, the state to do its job. Um, typically, there's a lot of back and forth, um, and it's you know excuse the expression, it's really kind of dumb stuff. We could you could you could you use the word and instead of or here, or could you? I mean, it's just it's little wordsmithing stuff that tends to make things take a while. Um, I do have to point out, based on the comments, that this has been on the board's agenda for two weeks now. Um, and I did send to the board a notice of the potential cuts to staff probably two weeks ago. Um, so I'm sorry if folks don't feel prepared. Um, I'm not sure about what part folks are not feeling prepared about. <clears throat> gotcha. I, I feel like. I'll just ask a clarifying or another clarifying, but. Why was that not in our board packet? The uh, which piece? It was emailed directly to to everyone in the in the board a couple of weeks ago to give you a, a preemptive heads up, and it was discussed in previous board meetings. Wait, right? I I just pulled up the email, and and there's not to to my understanding and my reading, there's not reference to which specific positions. I mean, there's explaining grant funded positions. Because I don't decide, I don't decide the positions. I just tell the FTEs from each of the categories, which is what I did. The right. administration at the local district, at the, the schools decide, and then it has to come back and go through this huge matrix of, of bumping rights and seniorities, which took about a week to figure out. Um, so it's a pretty complicated process. 
Oh, right, but but I think that could help um, someone understand why it's difficult for us, or it's it's easy for us to feel overwhelmed and unprepared right now when we're talking about very specific. It, it, what I understand, not a grant funded position and not an RTCC position that we're being asked to vote on right now. Um, that's partially why I feel unprepared for it. Because you didn't have the names of the folks? The, 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 the attachment that I'm looking at right now that you did send to us, and I can give you the day. I, uh, there, were, there were two or three of them. Um, there was one related to RTCC, there was one related to grants, and there was one related to professional staff. So I, I guess where it's, it, this is a long meeting and I, I know that we're all probably feeling pretty frustrated, but frankly, if the board isn't feeling prepared and that they have enough information to vote on something, even if you think that we have enough information, if we feel that we don't, then how are we to vote on it? Uh, you know, what someone feels we have and what we actually- You, you, know, follow, you follow policy governance. But again, you guys have to make the decision. I'm gonna, I'll clam up unless there's specific questions. This, you need to decide what what you're gonna decide. If you decide not to vote, that means I'll find the, I'll have to try to find the funding somewhere else. Um, most likely where it'll come from is I'll have to gut all the professional development that's been going on around math and ELA and trauma-based behaviors amongst the district. That's probably the only thing um, that I've got available that I, that I can touch that's not affecting staff because after April 15th, staff are locked in. So can I ask, Lane, when, when the administration comes to a decision on who they feel, who they're proposing be rift, are, are there alternatives or are we presented with, this is what we think, you have to vote yay or nay, and if you vote nay, then it goes back to the drawing board. I mean, could... this is an operational decision. Um, they did their research. This is the person they chose. Um, I shouldn't say person. This is the position they chose. I presented you with the reasons why they chose it. It was logical um, because of the low enrollments, um, you know, without, you know, mandating that the middle schoolers be there they had a good rationale for why they chose this position it wasn't done in a vacuum it wasn't a a card pulled out of a hat um, i'm these not are the implying that it was lane at all i just if if you are saying and correct me if i'm wrong but i think you explained to chelsea if we vote nay on this rift then I, I think you said you need to tell me where to find the money or does the administration need to to, to know where to find the money. Okay, if if I vote no on this RIF, who, okay, we need to find an alternative. I understand that. You can't make money out of thin air, but I don't believe if I vote that way that that's where it should come from. Valid, give, give me another option or tell me or, or charge me with finding another option. But the only, it feels yes, very- um, The only- the only, okay, there's a, there's a couple of things I think people need to understand. This riff at this point in time, one of the reasons that this is happening later than the others is because we were waiting for the last round of negotiations to see if we were in a reasonable range that the district could accommodate, even if it was a little bit above what we had had put into the budget, right? And we just had that meeting not too long ago. So we were waiting for that meeting to see what the outcome was going to be. The outcome was not good in terms of having to plan the budget. The outcome was that we were going to mediation um, and the, like I said, the union was at, at that point in time at 11% over two years with 5% in the first year. That's not something I can accommodate in the budget. So at that point in time, a week ago, when we had that meeting, it's like, oh crap. Yeah, I talked with folks about this that we may have to potentially do cuts and i even talked about the magnitude of those cuts um but it didn't materialize until the end of that negotiation session that 
that, you know, this, oh, oh, darn moment that we're in a position that, you know, we might be looking at more, having to pay more than we've got. Um, so yeah, there is a, there is a little bit of a time crunch to your right, but that's the, re the reason why that happened, if that makes sense. Um, that at that point in time, again, we went through, um, you know, the possibilities that went over to the RUH admin. This is what came back. We checked the bumping um, and determined that, you know, it would be this position, but it would bump another position. Um, so it, it turned around fast, but a lot of it was due to that last date that we negotiated. So a lot of our reactions, though, are coming out of that fast turnaround. So I just... Sorry. Can I yeah, and I'm not, I'm, negotiations? Not, I'm not disagreeing on, on, you know, your feelings at all. Um, but I, I just, I've been keeping people as informed as I humanly can. Um, May I explain something on the negotiations process? Just on how the process works? Yeah, it's oh, Ann's does, does the board yeah. feel like they need that information? Would that be helpful? I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it to the board, Nora, to, to find out. Does the board feel that's why, like that's why I'm asking you, Ann. I'm not trying does, to jump in. Does, does the board feel like they could use some explanation from Nora on on this? I need to see like uh can we see like no. thumbs up or thumbs down? No, 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 I no. don't. Okay. Uh it so, looks so like Ann, no. I'm, and I'm sorry, I just, I, I don't know if it's just so much information and I'm trying to just keep all of this straight. And so I feel like I'm gonna ask another question that's probably already been asked, but I just wanna really be very clear. So right now with Lane's directives from the board, he cannot run the organization without the money that is available to him. So yeah. with looking at the budget, he has determined that there is 5.16 positions that need to potentially be riffed. So is correct. that correct to that point? Because now I have more questions. Due, due to, yes, that is correct, but that's just for the grant funding portion. Okay. Those are, yeah. Okay, so thank you, Lane. That's the piece I feel like I'm missing. That 5.16, those are just the grant funded positions that are going to be riffed. And if this, everything goes well with the funding agencies, those positions will all come back. Yes. You got it, perfect. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. So now above and beyond the 5.16 grant funded positions, we need to cut two more additional positions. We need to riff two more potential positions due to the fact that we're still in contract negotiations. And those two positions were chosen to happen at RUHS in the entire district and all of OSSD. The administrative cabinet team chose two positions at RUHS. And one of those is going to be our ninth grade social worker I'm sorry, social, social studies, studies teacher. teacher. And then the second one is a position in the math department. Are those? No. Okay. So thank you. Where did Part, I go Partially. Okay. So, so the, the math position, let's start with that one. Um, the math position is a result of the grant funding. So the person who is funded by the grant, and this is under the, the contract and the rules in the contract, the person who is funded in the grant has seniority over the math person, and so would bump them from their position. Now, there is a, a development that is on that math piece. And again, that's the reason when I sent out the, um, so let's stick on the math piece for just a little bit so people understand. When I sent it out, it's I sent it out to the union, the notification that potentially up to this much, it doesn't have to be. Um, we have some transitions that have happened or are gonna happen in the math department that I believe do not mean that that point three has to go out um, to that particular person tomorrow. Um, 
but I've got to I've got to double check it because those discussions came up late this afternoon. So, but yes, the math position itself, if it happens, it's due to a grant position, and it's because the person in the grant position has seniority and is bumping that math person. Okay. The, okay. So, so that yeah. <laughs> so then we're five point one six with the grant and then we're one additional that is affecting the social study ninth grade social studies teacher and the other effect of that is that mr rainville's position is modified to include more classroom time at what we've heard from many at a cost potentially to the theater program so that's what that's what we're being asked to vote on this evening in essence yes okay thank you and very good that's not easy to follow now that i'm thinking about it uh, thank you ashley yeah i appreciate that as well katja and megan any any questions you following what, what we're being asked just to clarify do? things no, for just me very nice to yes okay so it is 906 is the does the board feel like it has enough information to make to um have a motion called on approving the rifts that the superintendent has put together uh late <laughs> how late can we can we well i don't know what else does the board need in order to be able to make this decision is there is there something else that we could get from either lane or do we want to look um I, am. I think i mean we have to make a decision tonight because april 15th is coming really soon so um, we kind of have two parts here. Um, I'll make the motion that we, that we approve the riffs for the, on the grant side to just move stuff ahead. So I make a motion that we approve the riffs, uh, for the, for the ones that are affected by the grants first. Okay. Do we have some, a second on that motion? And Brian's motion to approve the RIFs for the grant funded positions that most likely, but we don't have a crystal ball that we may not know for sure, will come through until once those grants are, are put in and accepted. Do we have a, a second for that motion? I'll second that motion. It's Megan. Megan Salt's gonna second that motion. Uh, do we have some discussion? Any more questions regarding that? Is everyone clear what they're voting on? Okay, so I'm gonna call the question. So all those in favor of accepting the RIF notices for the grant funded positions, please say aye. And I guess, can I see everyone? Uh, I can see everyone. I guess Rachel hasn't come come on, even though we're running really late. Uh, so I'll go through roll call. Um, Chelsea, sorry, I put you. You're new, and I put you first. So you're saying aye, okay? Uh, Ashley, aye. Brian, aye. Megan, aye. Katya, aye. And Hannah. Aye. And myself, aye. So the ayes have it. The ribs for the for the grant positions go through. Um, do we have a motion for the second tier of ribs for the one uh, social studies position? Is someone or a, a motion not to pass that rip? Go either way.
I have a suggestion. We could also um, direct Lane to go back to his budget and tell us um, if he didn't want to take away a position where he might take away some money uh, so that we don't have to remove a position. Do we want to, do we want, that's, that's another possibility. It sounds like that's something that we could ask Lane to do. I wondered that same thing, Anne, if we could be um, given other options to consider. And, we and, have, and if we need to vote on something tonight, then I move to um, uh, didn't, uh, not approve this RIF. Okay. I don't know how to vote not to do that. I make a motion. Well, you can make a motion to, to say we don't approve that this RIF, if you would like, Hannah. That is the motion I would like to make. Thank you. I move that we do not approve this RIF and consider other options. Okay, do we have a second for that motion? I'll second it. Tatcha is a second. Do we have some discussion regarding this motion? Um, uh, Lane, do we have time for any other options? The only thing I'm gonna say is number one, um, you are interfering in my operations. Number two, um you are putting me in a position where the cuts that i will have to make will prevent me um from achieving ends work that has been put into motion through blood sweat and tears um for three years now um and so again if you guys decide i will respect that i will abide by it um, and i will carry out whatever it is that you ask me to do with full integrity um, but i just want you to recognize the, the path you're treading right now Lane, that that I I, I got to speak up here because I, we've we've been asked to vote on something, and if we vote a certain way, uh, that's being made to to be invalid or or personal or negative. I mean, if we're given the it's, choice to vote one way or the other, it's going against all the one way or the other. That, it's going against all the policies that the board under the then executive. it shouldn't be a vote. If we're being set up to either accept something or violate our policies, then it shouldn't be. I'm, uh, I know, I know where you're coming from, and I I agree with you. Um, but I'm just saying the position that you're potentially putting me. I, I will. Then I'll like withdraw I said, I, it, my motion and not vote on it. I I feel totally set up here. I feel totally hang, hang on, bamboozled. Hang on. Let's, so, let's ask Lane, Lane, will you will you point out in what policy, what of our policies? says that we you're you're asking us to riff a position um you're based on but we also have to respond to the values and the ends that our community is expressing to us we're here we heard a, a huge outcry from the public um we don't know exactly whether or not we don't know where the negotiations are going to end up so we're not necessarily you're not necessarily over budget at this point exactly i don't know but the executive limitations are specific that i am not allowed to put us in a risk of financial jeopardy for something that can be foreseen this right, can be right. potentially foreseen everything in that budget there is no fluff in a budget it is all geared towards either staffing that's required to meet boards ends or program programming that we put in place to meet ends so any cut that we make at this point in time including brian including brian any cut that we make is detrimental to to achieving you know what i'm required to do under the board's policies so it, there, there is no good solution to any of this so, so when you go to write your ends report and you're doing your monitoring and your part of what you can do in your monitoring report for us is to say, well, board, you chose to, to put me in a position where I had to, to change the budget that I therefore had to reduce some funding towards such and such a program and therefore i was not able to meet that end that's that's 
okay. That's the, and then the board has to go out to the public and say, okay, we said that we were going to meet this end and we didn't. And that was, and then the public can vote us out. They can say, hey, you didn't hold the superintendent's feet to the fire or, or you, you put him in a position where he had to make some staffing choices and some funding choices in order to deal with your vote to, to not uh, support your position in terms of allocation of the budget. And, and we would have to accept that because we've, we've said, okay, we've, we've directed you to do that. We've said, look somewhere else. If we vote uh, according to Hannah's, Hannah's but, proposal to say, look somewhere else. But I would, I would weigh, I think it's important. I can tell you now where the cuts would have to come because they're, like I said, there's not fluff in a budget. Um, assuming we even have to make them. Okay. The, the odds are, hopefully we don't. So let's, 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 let's put that out there first. But if, if they had to come, we are potentially sacrificing all work on trauma, math, and ELA in one pan. On the other, we are still going to have a drama, a drama program that exists in the state that it did for many, many, many years. Brian it will still have a position with us in an exalted position. We'll be working in his field of study, which is social studies with kids. And so, again, taking the human element out for a minute and putting the objective pieces in the pan, I guess that's what you got to make your decision on. Um, my 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 intent my role um again you know all the the most appropriate thing to do is to go after that that professional development and the work that's happening in those areas we may not be able to fund carnegie math next year we you know we may not be able to move forward um with uh, you know the stern center coming in and working with us on our reading issues and our reading problems um, we certainly won't be able to do the executive uh, functioning training that that has already been started um, at the high school level. I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's a tremendous amount that's going to potentially be impacted by this position. The other thing that I could do um, is that we wait and see who leaves through attrition and I don't hire back, but that's just a surreptitious way of me taking the board's authority for the hiring authority for teachers out of your hands. Um, I just don't recommend a hire back. If I don't recommend them, you can't hire them. Um, so it's just, uh, yeah. So board members, you see what he has to, he, what he has to negotiate in his budget. So again, we have to decide whether or not we want to put him back into sort of looking at his budget and, and making cuts in a way that, I mean, we still are going to want him to, to, um, you know, meet the outcomes of the district. But he's, he may have to do it limping along if, and again, we've got so much uncertainty in terms of how everything is going to pan out in the long term in terms of the negotiations. And I know, again, this is not negotiations now, but um, it, it revolves around that. So, Hannah, I Whoop, go ahead, go ahead, Lance. I was going to say to make it easier, uh, board and, and Hannah, everybody, you got it's a decision. Um, I am not going to be upset or mad, or you know, my job is to come in here and plead my case and make my recommendation. I've done that. Um, but if you decide on something different, you're not going to get any grief out of me. Uh, my job at that point in time is to to make sure that I carry out faithfully as best best I can do. You know the charges I've been given. So don't let if if my personal feelings on the matter. If you're worried about that, don't let them bother you um, at all. Okay. So Hannah, do you still have your motion on the table for um, not approving the RIF and asking Lane to go look in the budget for some monies to cover? uh not riffing that position yes i stand by that motion and i hope it's still seconded by katya but if i need to make it again and ask for a second i can katya are you still seconding that motion 
I will still second that motion. Okay, do we have some discussion? Any discussion regarding that motion? Uh, my only, I'm sorry, me and my clarifying questions. No, um, that's great. If, if Lane is tasked um, with our vote to go and find alternatives, is that something we find out before the next school board meeting? Or is that something that he will notify us in um, May? Lane, how long do you think it's going to take you to figure out where you might come up with that money? And again, it's sort of hypothetical, but you, you're you trying to stay within yeah, your definition. I've already, it'll, it'll come from the professional development because I've, you know, I'll take another look, but that's the easiest, easiest piece to cut from. Um, without, you know, touching staff, which after April 15th, I can't do. <clears throat> Thank you. Any, any other questions or comments? Chelsea, I see you're unmuted. Did you have a question? I was just going to say it would be so helpful, like coming into the meeting or coming into any kind of conversation in the future if we knew what the options were so that we could look and think about it sort of in a way that makes sense and um, put some thought into it before just you know being blindsided like this tonight for the future whatever happens with this motion okay um I'm hearing that. I'm feeling that a little bit myself. Uh, any other comments regarding this motion? Any other questions? Are we ready to call the motion? Okay, I'm going to call the motion. So the motion is that we do not accept the RIF notification, the second RIF notification for the one FTE. Um, and that we send Lane back to his budget to see where else he might be able to um, find some money for that right now so that he stays in compliance with his budgeting parameters. So all those in favor, uh, do you want me to do a roll call? Okay, so um, this time I'm going to start from the bottom so I don't put Chelsea on the spot every time. So Hannah, you're up first. Yes. Aye. Katya, you're next. Aye. Megan. Aye. Brian. Aye. Ashley. Aye. Chelsea. Aye. And I from me. So, um, Lane, you've got you got some work to do, and um, and then we'll wait and and we'll be seeing what what happens over the next month or two. Or it sounds like this mediation process might go into the summer even. Before first first meet. meeting is June second. Okay. Um, and you'll just you'll continue to update the board as we as we go along. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is possible. It's almost it's nine twenty three. Uh, Megan, you're, you're monitoring how well we're doing, and we are way off track in terms of our timing. Um, we had uh, Winton on for the strategic planning. Um, I'm not even sure if he's still on the call. Um, but I'm wondering if we want to just table that discussion to the next meeting, rather than try and open that whole uh, discussion up at this point. Winton, are you on the call still? And I noted that little um, message box in the corner a while ago that he had left, gave okay. up on it. Okay. Um, 
so I think what we'll do is we'll we'll table that to the next uh, meeting, and that next meeting is um, in May. Um, or we may just have to hold a special meeting so that we can um, hear from uh, how that process is coming along. Um, so I need clarification because I'm not sure if the board has to decide. I believe we will have to decide whether or not to hold a special meeting to do well. Does the board does the board want to move on? I mean, we don't have Winton here to tell us about the strategic planning process and where things are at with that. Um, so, do we want to have a motion to? Yes, Nora. <laughs> sorry, Ann. I'm really sorry. I I just um, I know you you need to move on to other things, but point of clarification. I think there were some other things Lane needed to update the board on with negotiation in regards to support staff. Is that on the agenda? Uh, for tonight? Yeah, I didn't, I, that's on our consent consent agenda. We're just going to be um, approving that that. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I'm so sorry. Uh, unless Lane, you do you want to explain? We probably should explain that to the to the other board members that are not on that negotiation committee how that outcome came. Uh, yeah. So the um, support staff uh, April first meeting, I believe, um, the district offered the support staff a two year contract, three point seven five percent the first year, four point five percent the second year and no language changes. Um, following that meeting, the union had asked for a couple of days to think about it um, and then tentatively agreed. Um, so that agreement is in your packet, was sent to you earlier um, for the board to consider and to vote on tonight okay. Okay. as and a whole. Our, and that's in our consent agenda, yeah. um, which is coming up a little bit later. So, however, and, thank um, you this so is much. Ashley about strategic planning, and just to be able to put that one um, to bed, I guess. Um, if I, I would be happy to suggest that we have an additional phone call or meeting with Winton to hear his update as far as that process and how it's going, so then we can move on with the rest of the agenda. Okay, so if you I need that. I believe I'm, I'm, I probably need that as a, um, as a, as a, um, as a, uh, a motion to put it on the in for a special meeting. And, okay. and maybe, um, Katya, would you be willing to do a doodle poll thing so that we can find a time that works for everyone to do a special meeting with Winton and all of us to get an update on that so that we can move along with the agenda? Yeah. yeah. So, um, Ashley, can I say that you are moving to um, put the strategic planning discussion into a special meeting that we will decide via? Uh, Doodle poll and then invite, including Winton. I can get you Winton's uh, email, Katya, so that we can all um, listen to that information when we're a little fresher. And that sounds exactly like the motion I made. <laughs> you totally nailed it. <laughs> it, it. It is 928. Um, so, so do we have a second for Ashley's? uh motion to to table the strategic planning till we for a special second meeting that. okay the second by brian uh any discussion seeing none we're i'm going to call the motion so i'll do a roll call again let's see uh i'm going to start my screen has changed a little bit katya you're first i i megan i Brian. Aye. And Chelsea. Aye. Ashley. Aye. Hannah. Aye. And myself, aye. So we're going to table that. We'll get out a doodle poll for everybody to figure out when that might be. And we'll invite Winton as well in that doodle poll and hopefully be able to deal with that. 
Um, COVID operations, um, this is, uh, we need to figure out um, with the, the changes. So Lane, you're gonna update us on, the, on what has been um, put forth by the Agency of Education and all the other rules and regulations, the MOU, where we are with, with um, how kids are gonna be uh, receiving their education as, after. Yeah, so the, yeah, the um, board reserved to itself uh, the decision about what the learning modalities were. So um, my role is kind of give you current state, um, talk with you a little bit about, you know, recommendations after talking with the cabinet um, and kind of go from there. Um, current state, um, just so people know where we are right now, um, all students grades uh, pre-K through seven are back full in person four days per, per week. Grades in 11 and 12 have been at four days per week most of the year. Um, they have open campus. They kind of come and go when they don't have classes kind of at need. Um, so we're actually, we're better than most districts in terms of um, in-person instruction. We're probably better than about 90% of the districts that are out there. Um, there is a little bit of worry and concern right now because there's an exuberance um, that people have about the rate of vaccinations. Um, and it's translating into an increase in COVID rates in the state uh, because people are being just less vigilant in terms of protective measurements. Um, and so we'll talk about the seven rolling day averages um, at both the state level and in Orange County. Um, right now, um, the highest uh, rolling average uh, for case rates in Orange County was on November 22nd. That was 12 cases per day. Uh, at this point in time, we're averaging six cases per day, and that number has been rising um, since March 31st. Um, we had nine new, new cases today, um, eight on Friday. In fact, we had three cases in the schools today. Um, the time period between March 25th and today has had the highest rates of infection in the state of Vermont since at least October. I couldn't look back any further in the data that was available. Um, those rates right now are climbing from um, what I'm going to call a relative low because it's fairly high from a relative low of 151 cases per day on April 7th to 190 today and they are rising like this. Um, it's expected that they're going to continue to rise given that next week is April break. <laughs> and we've been getting lots and lots of calls from parents about travel. Um, and so it sounds like there's going to be a lot of traveling that's going on. Um, one of the things that came out of the discussion that the cabinet members had with the staff and with the cabinet members themselves um, was this idea that, and I think you heard a little bit of it mentioned earlier today, this idea of uh, we've been in a, in a state where we haven't had to transition between modalities for a long time, right? We went through this long period where you know, we tried to get the kids back and then, you know, two days later, we'd have to shut a school down or we'd have to shut half a school down. It's been pretty smooth sailing. We've had a case here or there, um, but because of how things are set up, it affects a very small number of kids. We can identify them quickly. They're out. Everybody else stays. <coughs> and so, um, you know, that's been a nice thing about the state that we're in. Um, Vaccinations, I sent an email out to the board on this a while back um, <clears throat> about the state of vaccinations. Um, things opened up on March 20th for the staff. Um, only about 20, 30% of the staff were able to actually get appointments when that first opened up. And um, probably over the course of the next two or three weeks following that, you know, the sign up, um, the sign ups, um, kind of increase. There are more spaces available. <laughs> so it wasn't like all the, <laughs> the staff members were able to sign up on March 20th and get their shots. Then it was spread out over two or three weeks. Um, most of the shots that they were getting were the Moderna vaccine at the time. <laughs> Apologize, I got allergies. Um, the Moderna vaccine is six weeks um, from the time of the first shot. You get the first shot, it's a four week wait, you get the second shot, and then it's a two week wait, and then you're considered protected um, as much as the vaccine can give. So based upon kind of timelines and stuff and how many people that we still have waiting, 
The staff kind of as a whole unit would be in a really good spot on or about May 17th um, in terms of actually having their protections in place. Um, so that's current state right now. Um, we had some discussions about the fact that, you know, we're at the, in four days per week and, you know, why not move to five days per week? Um, and there's a couple of things that are going on, I think, that people need to be aware of. Um, the federal government didn't approve the state's request to waive testing, right? So we still have to do the math uh, SBAC, the ELA SBAC, the Vermont Science Assessment, um, and the ELL assessments. And so all the students, even the ones that are in the remote modality, the ones that chose to be remote all year, they have to come in because the testing has to happen in school take the testing here in a monitored environment. And so what's been going on is we've set this up so that every Friday we're rotating those kids through. And those rotations on Fridays will continue to happen through uh, Memorial Day, through the end of May. All right, so we've got the Fridays used. We don't have all the kids coming in on Fridays, but having them come in to do this testing on those days is allowing us not to disrupt the other four days that they are here. Um, we also had a discussion with the nurse, nurses, and one of the things that we discovered is um, having the Friday off um, has actually saved us having to close the schools a number of times. Um, people that get infected, they tend to get infected over a weekend. By the time their symptoms show up, it's usually Thursday or Friday of the following week. And so with people not in school on Friday, there's a lot of exposure that's been reduced because of that, just because of how things naturally fall. We added it up. There's between four and five times that we didn't have to close the school because of those Fridays being off. Um, the other thing that's going on right now is most of the teachers planning is happening on Fridays. And a lot of the year end reviews with the, um, the educational support teams and the IEP teams is all happening on Fridays. Um, so there is quite a bit of work that's happening there. Again, board decision, I'm not going to argue uh, or feel bad if you decide something different, but the recommendation um, from the cabinet and from me is to stay uh, four days uh, through the rest of the year um, at this point in time. Also remember that the last day for students is June 11th, right? So it's it's not that far off. The state um, changed the, the law for this year in terms of the number of student days. It's 170. It was reduced. So the last student day is June 11th. So it's, um, you know, if the teachers came back on the 17th and we got the kids back then, we'll talk a little bit about some of the work that, that needs to be done if that were to happen. It's only a couple of weeks. Um, and we got Memorial Day in there and we got April vacation in there, which, you know, we're worried about people, you know, feeling a little freer because the vaccines are flowing that they're not going to, you know, behave the best. Um, in terms of return on the grades that remain, we've got grades 8, 9, and 10. It's possible to bring them back, but there's some pretty big hurdles um, that we have been working on. Um, and the question is, is do we want to do that amount of changing around um, again when the students are done on June 11th. High school master schedule would need to be reworked. They've already kind of planned out what it would look like, um, but it would require some students to change teachers. Uh, under the six foot guidance that, that existed, um, we had things set up dramatically different than regular classroom spaces. Um, and so all that would have to be moved back. It would probably take, um, over the April vacation for the, the custodial staff to be able to make that happen. Um, we also did a little bit of research in terms of what other districts are doing. And the Vermont Principals Association had a survey that they put out that shows that most schools are still in hybrid mode and intend on staying that way uh, because it's less risky given the current increase in cases and the potential impacts of April vacation and Memorial Day. Um, so again, like I said, we're already ahead of the curve. Um, and so my recommendation, recommendation of the cabinet, again, is to stay the course. Um, part of it, again, it's the longest stretch of consistency we've had, you know, not switching back and forth between modalities, which is really good for the students. The year is quickly coming to a close. Um, and I have these worries is that, you know, 
we're potentially taking this this last group of individuals that is unvaccinated, which which are our older students, and we are putting them in a higher risk situation by bringing them back. And so that concern um, sits there. Um, and again, we expect the cases are going to be rising, you know, while we're potentially bringing these kids back. We've got those two vacations in there, which are during warmer weather, which people are going to be traveling. Um, so I would argue that we just stay the course with where we're at. But if the board um, really wanted to see more kids back, I would argue limit it to eighth grade. Um, the eighth grade are, you know, they're transition students. They're getting ready for high school. Um, and, you know, it might not hurt them at all um, to get back into a regular kind of routine, um, you know, before they start the ninth grade. And so I'll stop there a lot, just said a lot in case there's questions. So board questions, <laughs> Ashley, go ahead. And yes, thank you. I would like to speak. Um, thank you, Lane, for sharing that information. Um, but I am not on board with that plan. Um, I believe that there needs to be equity for all of our children. And right now there are three grades that are not having the same experience as their classmates. And uh, we have done an excellent job this year as a district in updating the air handling systems. The weather has improved. There are outdoor learning opportunities for our kids that they can participate in. And our eight ninth and 10th graders deserve to be in that class in, in those classrooms having not only an academic experience but a social experience i appreciate the comment about the eighth graders gearing up to be in high school next year but i'd like to talk about the ninth graders who did not have the opportunity to have that transition from eighth to ninth grade the way they should have and i feel very strongly that our children should be back in school, all of them, K through 12, after April vacation on April 26. We talked um, over the summer about the master schedule being updated. So when we could indeed get these kids back in school, there would not be an administrative obstacle. So these are all things that could have been happening in the background. And now if it's a time crunch, then it's a time crunch but I, I am advocating strongly for our children that they need to be back in school for these last few weeks to get the education in a different capacity amongst their peers um, and end the year on a high note. So the only, only comment that I'm gonna make is you know that veiled comment that if there's a time crunch, there's a time crunch and the implication that the planning wasn't done. The planning for the change in the master schedule and where the rooms and everything need to be was done. It's sitting there, it's ready, the chairs were ordered. We are in a situation where the rates in the state are the highest that they have ever been and they are increasing. We have a vacation coming up. We have the 117 variant that's running around that is more contagious, 50% more contagious than what's currently there and it's taking over the state right now. Um, in terms of what they're finding in the research, and I go back six months ago to kind of what I said to the board at that time, was this idea that, yeah, you know, research is only as good as the information that we currently have. Right now, at that point in time, six months ago, the research was, yeah, the, the, the younger kids get it. It's not that big a deal. Most of them shrug it off. But the question that remains unanswered, that an answer is starting to appear to now, was this idea is what is the long-term effect? What is the impact of, of, of damage on vascular systems and cardiovascular systems um, and neurologic systems? And the research is showing that 30 to 40 percent of the people that are getting this disease are having neurological disorders at this point in time. So again, we come back to this question where for seven weeks, is it worth that risk when we are so close to the end? When vaccinations will be happening, um, hopefully they're studying their tails off to try to get it so that the kids are vaccinated by the time we get back in the fall. I understand uh, about wanting the students back. I think it's, it's important too. But again, I always go back to take the emotions out of it, put things in the balance and make the decision off, off the balance. Does the risk 
outweigh the potential benefit at this point in time. And so I'll leave my words with that. I'd like to comment, if I may. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Um, I, I just want to point out that uh, whether we agree with this proposal, and I happen to, um, or not proposal, recommendation, um, one or the other doesn't not care for the kids. I, I, I just, I'm, I'm needled a little when um, there is a, an implication that one side, one side cares about the kids and, and the other doesn't, and that's, that's just not the case. Thank you. Okay, are there any other um, comments or questions from board members about about the um, whether or not so we would we would be looking at either um, going along with the recommendation that Lane and the cabinet has made or um, coming up with uh, uh, maybe a motion, maybe Ashley wants to make a motion about um, uh, asking for a different uh, timeline and time frame for getting all students back at the school. Um, so Chelsea, do you, I saw that you're unmuted. Would you like to ask a question or have something to say? I would just like to add a little conversation to this topic. I think, um, I have two children. One goes to Woodstock High School, one goes to Randolph. And uh, we just got word that the um, my daughter who goes to Woodstock is on break now, and they are going back to four days a week after break for the remainder of the year. So I think it's doable. I think it becomes, uh, you know, you weigh the risks of everything. I think the kids who have been remote and have been um, in the hybrid model could benefit from going back to school and being with their peers and that socialization. I think it's important that they have that to finish out the year so that they finish strong. It's like mental health, physical health, what's the risk, what's the benefit and it it seems like at this point in the COVID cycle we're at a point where we can reintroduce those learning opportunities for the rest of the kids. That's all. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, anyone else have um, I have a question actually questions or concerns or yes, go ahead, Katya. Um, I was just, I know that, um, and, and this is mainly for Lane, correct me if I'm wrong, when we had the seventh grade come back, part of the issue with not being allowed to bring the eighth grade back was because the seventh grade, this class size required that they take over some of the eighth grade space. Is that correct? Yeah. So remember the guidance has changed, right? They're saying three feet now, you know, as long as people are, are properly masked. Um, so there were spaces that were taken up to accommodate the 11th and the 12th grade, right? Because they've been coming kind of all along. So there was extra space that was taken up by that. There was um, the seventh grade class was the largest class. So there was an incredible amount of space that they took up because of that six foot spacing that, that was required. And a lot of moving around and a lot of equipment that was purchased and put into place to, to make that happen. And so um, a lot of it is, uh, you know, the more kids that we bring back, the more of that that has to be undone, um, which is fine. I mean, you know, April break would be the, the, the right time to do it if we were going to do it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's the, the physical amount of spacing. On the positive, it's been a pretty warm spring so far. We have um, connected um, with Perry to try to get them to come out and set our tents up to try to do more outside. Um, and so, you know, that, that may, may help as well. Um, but again, I, with me, I just, I worry about the, the, the rise in the cases that's happening, especially approaching a vacation that we haven't even started yet. But with the new guidelines, we are able to maintain a three-foot space with the student capacity that we could, could potentially have with bringing other classes back? 
the statement, and I would wish I had it right in front of me that I could read directly from the RUH administrators, is that in, in, in cases, yes, we can, but there are some cases that still make us incredibly nervous. Um, you know, we do have larger classes. You know, our, our average class size at the, the high school is, is 9 to 11 kids, but we do have classes that are 23, 24, 25, 26, too. Um, and so that makes it a little bit more problematic. And the more kids that you have come back, the less choices that you have, right, the less open spaces you have to kind of put the puzzle together and, and move people around. <clears throat> Megan or Brian, do you have any um, questions or comments? Well, yeah, I'll just kind of second what Ashley said. I, I think it is time we have, you know, three grades left to, to get back in at least four days a week. And if there's any way we can get them in as soon as possible after, you know, April break sounds like a good idea to me. But um, that's where, where I'm at is this needs to happen because those grades are not getting the education that they – the other ones are and they're not the experience or the time and i think if we can we should definitely get them in as soon as possible Me megan do you have any concerns or questions are you no no okay lane i i have one question and that is um have you have you checked in with the the ninth grade team the eighth grade team and the 10th grade team to see from the teaching perspective, are students falling? Have they fallen behind dramatically? Are they seeing, are they feeling like we really need to get these kids back in in order to get them up to speed? No, they, the, actually I can even pull up my notes if I can find them and, and read them to you. Um, the basic idea is that we're in a steady state right now um, and that's good. Consistency is good. Um, the worry is, is that if we bring kids back in while case rates are going up, we're going to be back in that choppy, you know, we're here for three days, we're in remote session for a week, we're here for three days, um, remote session for a week. And that's the biggest concern that they have is they don't want to go back to that, that, that lack of uh, consistency. But let me pull up the notes. Give me just two seconds. Um, it's been a long night, so I actually it's better that I read it instead of try to do it out of my head. <laughs> no, it's it's okay. It's it is it is what it is. Um, we still have just so that people know, there's still 15% of the elementary students are fully remote and will remain that way, and 13% um, of the high school kids, the R R U H S R U kids, started um, fully remote. They're saying that the students that have transitioned back. Um, are having a lot of trouble. Um, so what what they're also worried about is that um, it's going to take some time for them to get acclimatized again um, to being on a, a regular schedule. And there's going to be a lot of behavioral, a lot of uh, other disruptions that are going to interfere with the academics for the first week or two when they come back while they reestablish those routines. Um, they Again, they really like the Fridays because of uh, a lot of the work, any of the students that are that are out um, hybrid or, or remote that are struggling, they physically come in and meet with their teachers on Fridays um, and do one on one work and, and what with them. Um, students are transferred. Students that are transferred back are struggling because of the abrupt transition. So we talked a little bit about that. Um, they said whether it's three or six feet, there's still concerns in spacing in some of the larger classes. Uh, da, da, da. Does that mean they can't be a, 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 they can't fix those, or does does that mean what does that mean exactly? Uh, which of the two pieces that I just talked about? The 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 three to the three feet distancing and sort of accommodating the spaces. If given if, the if you get everybody back. It, it's there are still going to be some problems um, potentially with the three feet. Um, the guidance that they changed, and again, um, it's basically you know three feet if you can manage it. Um, so it's it's not very helpful. I think the guidance is actually very good. I just think it's a month too early. Um, I think what they're what what they've got planned. I think they just did it a month earlier than they should have. But that's my own opinion. 
And do administrators have any concerns about uh, teaching staff or support staff coming back or, or deciding they? No, I think, um, I think people feel a little more relaxed about the vaccination piece. But remember the timeline, you know, we're talking, we're talking mid-May before, you know, the majority of the faculty would have had time to have gotten in, gotten both of their shots and, and had the two weeks to be able to, um, you know, know that they're protected. So, you know, that May 17th is, is, a, is, a, is a reasonable date on the, the staff side. I mean, Nora's here. This is one where you might invite her in. Um, I'm sure she's had a lot of discussions. I see, I see Tev has his hand raised, yeah. so maybe I'll, I'll go with Tev. I, I, was, I just want to make sure the board was aware that we have, I see at least one member of the eighth grade team, the middle school principal. Um, so I think you have the experts in the room, not to yeah. say that Lane is not an expert, but just not wanting you to have to extrapolate too much from your notes. I think if you want detailed um, sense of what the impact would be, there's lots of folks who could speak to that. Yeah, and I think that's an awesome, because I, I am, I'm the middleman in some of the conversation. Yeah. Can we hear from them? Is Lisa here? Lisa, I'm are here. You, are you here? Are you willing to? share a little bit yeah um we we have done um a lot of the planning around what it would look like what the schedule lo would look like to bring everybody back four days a week um our biggest concern is around some of the rooms that are really tiny if you think about the wing that heads toward the senior high gym and go into some of those classrooms um those rooms are smaller than rooms in other parts of the building. And so achieving the um, distancing in those spaces, I think it's it's likely doable, um, but at the same time, it's gonna be tight. Um, and some of that, there are a lot of logistics um, that will need to go in to making that happen. Um, as well as scheduling logistics, particularly, um, with world languages, which have been fully remote all school year. So students in the hybrid modality have been taking their world languages classes um, on their remote days. So then we have to figure out how to fold that back, back into the schedule so they can finish the year um, with their world language class. I'm trying to think of the other logistics um, that we've been talking about. And Katie, I think, is on by phone, so she may be here as well. Um, but we've definitely been talking about it. We definitely have plans for what the schedule um, could look like. I do worry about the fact that people um, may not be fully vaccinated until mid-May, and with the um, closer rooms or more people in those spaces, that that is a concern. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm a little foggy too. I went to the design meeting before I came to this meeting. So it's been a few hours in the grid along with Anne. And we're almost at 10. Yeah. Uh, are there any any other questions for either Lisa or Lane? Um, and I, this is Katie Sutton. I'm, okay. I'm here if you can hear me. Go ahead, um, yeah, the only one other um, challenge I'll mention is that when we brought the grade seven students back, we made significant uh, classroom moves that would have to be kind of undone and reshifted and rearranged, um, which again is is just quite an upheaval for both the teachers who move, but you know even more importantly for the students and their in their learning environments. Um, so again, it, it's as Lane suggested that you know there and and as many of you have said, there's this cost benefit analysis of knowing that that reacclimation and the kind of storming and norming that we do at the beginning of every year would have to be replicated. So, you know, those first couple of weeks at least would need to be spent on reestablishing the classroom environment so that it is one that is, you know, healthy for kids to feel welcome and safe in, um, in order to, to learn. And maybe I'll just piggyback quickly just to the point about, you know, where is the staff at? You know, we sent out uh, our most recent of many surveys of this year, just to try to get a, a sense of that. And I think the pretty strong feeling was that folks are comfortable with what's going on, recognizing obviously that they're, um, that it's not ideal, 
that there that there are inequities, um, but that the level of disruption and um, various other factors made it nearly unanimous among the people who responded to the survey. And then I also just wanted to make one point about the equity issue that Ashley raised, which you're right, Ashley. I mean, you you are not wrong that there is an inequity there. I I do want us to take a step back and think about the inequities that are maybe less visible in the quote unquote normal runnings of school and that we can sort of predict pretty systematically which kids will have a much harder row to hoe in school. Um, and, and again, not to like make, say that it's okay, but it, it is something that happens. And I, I will say that one of the things that I have seen in this year is that I have felt, and I'm, I'd be surprised if there weren't other educators in the grid who agree with me, more able to address the needs of the kids who I know are systematically underserved, um, understanding that I'm not meeting kids' needs as well as I usually do. Um, and I worry that going back to full-time in person um, for kids who suffer from anxiety, for kids who have medical needs, um, which make the whatever the risk level, um, a much more serious risk than for those of us who are, who are relatively healthy. Um, and for kids for whom a disruption to their learning routine is not something that they can just roll with the way that many kids can. So I, you know, I, it's a very complex question. I, and I don't in any way, I really appreciate, appreciated what you said, Hannah, about none of us are not on the side of the kids here, right? I mean, I'm, I'm I, it, in no way I'm trying to um, say that, but it is, there's a lot of nuance to it, and and I appreciate you um, making the time to hear from some of us who, who see that up close and personal. So, thank you. Okay, it's ten o'clock. We've heard from a lot of folks. Uh, does the board feel like they have enough information to uh, make a motion in terms of the modality? I'm I'm seeing people like, yes, no, are you ready to, do we have someone ready to make a motion? So I'm going to stand by what I started with. And okay. I think for equality for our 8th, ninth, and 10th graders, they deserve the same experience as preschool through 7 and 11th and 12th graders. And I make a motion that our eighth, ninth, and tenth graders re resume in-person learning um, the Monday after April break. I don't know that date off the top of my head, um, and and have the same schedule as, as they are um, as the other kids that are part of the OSSB district that are currently getting four days a week. Okay, second. Second, Brian is going to second that motion. Do we have some discussion around that motion? Okay, I'm going to call the motion then. So all those in favor of Ashley's motion that the district uh, return to full in-person uh, for, well, full four days in person for the 8th, 9th, and 10th graders resumes after April break, which would be April 26th. Um, please say aye when I call your name. And I'm gonna start with you, Ashley. Aye. Uh, Chelsea? Aye. Brian? Aye. Megan? Aye. Hannah? No. Katya. Aye. And I'm a nay, so the ayes have it. So we are going to direct Lane to direct his cabinet to try to, well, no, to make a four day in person for the eighth, ninth, and tenth graders. And hopefully, Lisa and Katie are aware so can start kind of getting themselves ready for that process. Okay, so we are moving along 
very limping along, I should say, maybe. Um, legislative update. Uh, Lane, do you have anything on that that you think is pertinent that we really should be? Uh, probably just the two, the two biggies, the uh, state pension fund that they were working on um, doing some pretty massive changes that would have had a negative impact on state employees kind of imploded on itself. Um, there's still work that they have to do because there's a huge deficit there, um, but they've kind of backed off uh, based on the recommendations that, that had been put forth. Um, the other one was the universal school meal, meals bill, the idea that you know um, districts should be providing free lunch and breakfast to all students in the district um, at, at district cost. It was basically an unfunded mandate. Um, the legislature heard from quite a few people and when they heard the cost that it was going to be a, between 24 and 40 million, um, that ended up um, at this point, at least the last I heard, Diana slow death. Um, so I don't think those two are, are, are going anywhere anytime soon. So those would be the two big ones because they would have had the, the big financial impacts um, for, and, potentially and for the district. And the waiting <laughs> study, that, that's also been sort of put on the back burner also yeah they um let me find my notes on the waiting study they um are pretty confident it's not going to pass um they were really worried that if it's not phased in property that properly that there was going to be huge um, shifts in tax implications right 30 to 40 cents um either gains or losses in districts over the course of the year um, and they haven't remodeled the weights since 2020, so they really don't know what the total financial impacts might be. Um, and so it's going to probably be another couple of fiscal years um, while they kind of review stuff and try to come up with a good plan that'll that'll make it work. So my guess is it's probably two or three years down the pike. Okay. All right. So then we we'll move on to the consent agenda. So um, in that. Um, we had the minutes from uh, the regular meeting on March 8th. We have the special meeting on the 22nd of March. Uh, we have the professional contracts. We have the administrative contracts. We have the superintendent's contract. Um, there's a facilities. Uh, approve the facilities request for use of facility facility reserve funds. That normally we have to pull out and do a a um, vote on, correct? You um, need I've our seen, approval I've, to use uh, reserve funds. Yeah, I see. I've seen it done both ways. Um, so I guess it depends if uh, how much discussion folks want. Um, I believe this is on the well. Pardon? I believe that this one is on um, redoing the Brookfield the well. well. Yeah. Okay. So I'm happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Does the board have any questions regarding the, the reserve fundings being used for the well? We looked at that the last time when you went over the, the facilities. Yeah. Okay. And then approving the su support staff agreement that he talked about in the in the negotiations update so i am going to ask that we um just pass the consent agenda as a whole um can we have someone move to do that i move to, to uh, approve the consent agenda as presented i second, second. Oh. ashley ashley lincoln is going to second uh, is there any discussion? Any questions, concerns? Okay, I'm going to call the question. So, um, all of those in favor of approving the consent agenda as uh, as written in the agenda, uh, please say aye. And I'm going to call starting with Katya. Aye. Megan. Aye. Brian. Aye. Chelsea. Aye. Ashley. Aye. Hannah. Aye. And myself. Aye. So it's unanimous. Okay. okay.
And then, uh, oh, you know what? I'm realizing that we never, never got back to, uh, oh, did we did. I don't know if I need a motion to say that we are going to use the July meeting for uh, training. Uh, I'm guessing we probably do. So that's back. Sorry, I'm I'm going back. We I neglected to see that when we moved into the next thing on the because we moved the uh, RIF discussion above the board training and deciding whether or not we want to use that July meeting. Can I can I have a motion that we want to use that July meeting? I make the motion okay. that we use the July meeting for uh, board training. I second. Okay. And Hannah is going to second that. Do we have any discussion on that? OK, uh, I'm going to call the question then. Is everyone uh, in favor of Hannah's uh, motion that we, or wait, was it Brian? Sorry, Brian. <laughs> Brian, uh, motion that we use the July meeting for uh, a board training on, on governing policy. And I will start with Ashley. Aye. Chelsea. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Megan. Aye. Hannah. Aye. Gotcha. Aye. Myself. Aye. And, um, We'll talk about the specifics of exactly what the training is on the next. Uh, why don't we talk about that at the next board meeting just so we can move along here. Um, and then where are we? We are on incidental information. Those were the superintendent's reports and the principal's reports and the director of the RTCC. Financial report and other incidental. Um, we have an update on the uh, staff appreciation plans. So, Lane, anything that you want to sort of fill us in in regards so, to your? I think the the big piece is uh, you know we're in the middle of doing the work on the ESR two monies that have come in 1.3 million. Um, that is tied to a recovery plan that the um, cabinet has been working on um, each Wednesday. Um, we're actually, we're, we're approaching completion of that. Um, those funds are specifically designed for um, us to use our data to identify what deficiencies the kids have that are a direct cause of COVID and to fund the implementation of programs and staff that, that will help address those needs. Um, and so we're well ahead. The due date for that's uh, June 1st for the completed um, recovery plan. Ours may very well be complete before we break for April um, vacation. So. Excellent. Um, and how are we looking financially? Actually, um, uh, really good. Uh, I was taking a look at the breakdown earlier. Um, there was nothing at all that jumped out at me as, as a concern at this point in time. Um, you know, there are some, um, some of the lines are a little overspent at this point in time, but that's because we're still waiting for the reimbursement for the ESSER 1 funds that'll cover it. Um, but we're, we're in pretty good shape. Okay. And we'll know, we'll know, we'll know about surplus if we have one, um, probably mid at the May May uh, board meeting. Yeah. Okay. Any questions for Lane from board members? Okay. Uh, Ashley and Katya, you were working on on a uh, plan for um, our staff appreciation. Nora, close your ears. I was saying, don't we kind of keep this a secret? There's a lot of teachers on here. I know. Well, <laughs> can I say that it's um, well? I, I say, Alvin, thanks so much. <laughs> and and going to be executed flawlessly is my update. Okay. Uh, awesome. Okay. 
Awesome. Okay, so Megan, <laughs> we're on to board evaluation. And uh, I apologize, it's 1014. Uh, we are way over time. <laughs> uh, yeah, so do you really want to know what I wrote? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay. well, yeah, what were you going to say? Well, uh, I, I would say we, we, we have uh, timing issues. Okay, so I gave us a lot of ones. Um, I did give us a five for the meeting being well attended. Um, honestly, it was... Uh, Pretty, I, I don't know, it was pretty mixed. Um, a lot, there's a lot of threes on the second page. I gave us a four um, for debating. Um, yeah, I don't know if you really wanna know all this stuff. Uh, three for participation, um, three for members listening act attentively. Um, there was really no side conversations uh, because this is remote. Um, the participants treating each other with respect and courtesy. I did give us a two. Um, work was accomplished. I gave us a two um, in, in an atmosphere of trust and openness. Uh, was a little heated at moments. Um, all actions considered by the board were clearly the board's work. I gave us a two. Uh, the board reviews what it had what it has already said in its policy about each specific topic before discussions on that issue. I gave us a two. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the board chair helps the board get its job done rather than supervising or becoming involved in staff work. I did give us a two. Um, it was kind of just, there was so much going on. Um, nothing with you, Anne, really. It was just the, the meeting itself. Um, and then the board supports the superintendent in any reasonable interpretation of applicable board policies. I gave us a two just because we had that discussion about what to do if we all say no or voted no, I should say. Um, and that's my evaluation. Thank you, Megan. That, that was a difficult meeting. Um, and we do have an executive session on here. Um, do we feel like it's necessary? Or... Uh, the, the elite, there's three things we should talk about. There's one you want to talk about. <laughs> and okay. Anne, so, Anne, this is Linda. Yeah. I need to have you stop by tomorrow to sign contracts. Sure. Please. Okay. Thank you. Um, Lane, what, what, um, for what reason are we going into executive session? Like we're supposed to be citing the, the legal reason why yeah. we're moving to, to, so. Uh, there are, there are three personnel issues, um, some of which may result in legal action. Okay. So, uh, in our, so what, so it's because of, uh, possible did you get legal counsel from uh pietro that we may be in legal jeopardy around something uh may not necessarily be us that's in legal jeopardy okay uh, i don't know the, the appropriate way to word it may be the ones going after um yeah so do we so, have a link to our executive session yeah i just emailed it Thank you. Uh, a little while ago. So okay, we so ahead? we need to move to executive session, but I need a motion to move to executive session. I move that we move to, I move that we exit this meeting and enter executive session to discuss personnel issues. I second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Let me just raise your hand. Uh, looks like we've got... Uh, majority majority vote so we'll see you in executive session Do, can we just would you like me to adjourn out? the meeting I'll, yeah. I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting i make a motion that we adjourn the meeting at 10 34. don't we have to say that we come back in and um that no action was taken oh, yeah. during executive session what brian said <laughs> <laughs>
So you got So with no action taken from executive session, I make a motion that we adjourn the meeting at 1034. Sorry, so there... I, I had so much <laughs> material that I couldn't, I had to get the, the keep going and go down because <laughs> I had so many emails from everybody. I couldn't find the meeting link. I was like, it was there before, but I have so many emails from people. I apologize. So did we turn Katja? Did you take over? Because yeah, like, we're working on we're working on it. I think, I think Brian was going to second that adjourning, and then we were there you go. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Right. Raise your hand. Meeting adjourned. Everyone, have a good awesome. rest of your night. Take care. Bye bye.